Okay, so now, chat, we're finally moving on. We've talked about materials. We've talked about mags. We're now at the meat of the guide. You can see we have... Well, actually, you can't see because there's a scroll bar. But we have a lot to talk about with items. So give me one second as I rehydrate because we're going to be talking for quite a while here. Much better. Stay hydrated, everybody. So, you're fresh into the game. You've learned about mags. You've learned a little bit about materials. I guess like I guess the only thing I didn't really talk about is where materials. I'm gonna say materials drop and then on area. As random drops from all sources. All right, just put a little note there for people that aren't familiar with materials. So items. <laughs> So now, now that you've understood how to level your mag, let's talk about different types of weapons that will help carry you to the end of the game. So generally speaking, what'll happen is that most characters will start off with a saber, which is a good single target weapon. Uh, if your character has low ATP, it tends to be one of the more damaging weapon types. So if you're fighting an enemy that seems to not take a lot of damage, you might want to consider swapping into a Saber, even as like a Force, if you're out of TP, as an example. One of the life-changing item types for Rangers is a Shotgun. Please get a Shotgun. It makes the game so much easier. I can't emphasize this enough, chat. It is so, so imperative you find one. I don't recall if you could get one in Forest. I'm sure people that run the game from vanilla over and over and over again can say when you get it. Normally, if I'm playing through the game, from what I recall, I will always receive shotguns by mines if I'm playing the game normally. I may or may not get at one in caves. I don't think you could get one in forest, I believe is how the breakdown is. So once you get this, this allows you to hit up to five targets, and hitting five targets at once at a distance is incredibly powerful. Don't let the name shotgun fool you. This thing is basically hyper accurate. It's a spread shotgun that basically does not really miss ever. Which is incredibly, incredibly good when you're playing as the ranger. When you can just push back entire rooms before they can even reach you. So incredibly powerful. But until you get to that point with the shotgun, or let's say you're looking to do more damage against certain bosses, like the worm boss in episode 1 and episode 2, uh, there's a weapon type called the Partisan, or the Spear. This is really, really, really good for male characters in particular to just kind of bully everything in the room. And this will probably be your first and major uh, crowd control type. Forgot to put one in here that's probably important to note for Hunters. Put it here. So one other option for crowd control before you get things like the shotgun is a slicer. It's basically like a throwing disc that will ricochet to different targets. Every character class can use this. Hunters will use this as their main ranged AoE because they don't really have other options. Uh, forces later in the game will switch to using this over their techniques in certain scenarios. And sometimes rangers use it because again, you might not get a shotgun right away. Now, from the crowd control perspective of Hunters, there's a weapon type called Sword. Not to be con confused with Saber. Sword is like your big, giant, massive sword. This is like your typical fantasy hero sword that is many times the size of your character. The benefits of it over the Partisan is it hits more to the left and to the right than the Partisan does, but, but it does not hit as far forward. Now, this can still be used in boss fights like the Worm Boss in order to hit multi-part bosses, so that way one swing will hit five times or four times rather than just attacking once with Saber. Um, personally, I'm not a big fan of the sword type, just from personal preferences. However, it's still very important to use, and I think you do need to be aware of this, that there are some situ situations you will find it easier in the early game, I think, to push away enemies with the Partisan than the Sword, because the Partisan will hit further in front of you than the Sword. It's also more forgiving if you whiff, which is a common problem with early Hunters, where their accuracy might not be the best for power attacks. Whereas the Partisan will generally be safe even if you whiff, if you're doing it max distance. I just want to draw all those distinctions there. Uh, but the Sword is incredibly useful, in particular the late-game Swords. 
where people will be using those basically over the partisan in almost every scenario. I'm gonna make one one note here. So regardless if you're playing a ranger, a force, or a hunter, most characters will end up with a pistol at some point. But this is your only real consistent damage option as a hunter. And unfortunately, a lot of bosses in this game, you are not able to melee for long stretches, if at all. So please bring a pistol. If nothing else, if you're playing a Hugh Cast or a Hugh Casile that has traps, you can use that pistol to trigger your traps sooner than normal. Rather than waiting for the enemy to be close, you could just fire at it to detonate it early. Alternatively, uh, you can use a sniper for that, which is specific to the rangers. Uh, snipers are really good for very safe room clear. So if you're not feeling very confident in your ability to handle a room, rangers are able to basically kind of walk in and out of doorways and hit them from literally the doorway and then retreat through the doorway whenever anything comes vaguely close to them. The rangers are incredibly easy to level even with terrible, terrible stats or no materials or no mags due to the fact that they could just literally hit like halfway into a room with the sniper. The people will take that for some safe room clears, but it's also meta to take for some bosses where again, the boss might be at a very big distance to you, like for example, uh, falls in episode one, likes to zip around an arena, and if it's at the max distance of the arena, it's not possible to hit with the pistol. But there are some scenarios where you, you will need the sniper over the pistol if you want to continue to do DPS. Sniper will generally be a bit stronger than pistol in terms of damage dealt, but it's also slightly slower. It's just a small trade-off there. And finally, there's the mech gun, where people will probably just call it the machine gun. Even I sometimes call it the machine gun. Um, essentially, it for every time you hit a normal attack or a power or a special, it'll shoot three shots. So instead of one attack hitting, instead of doing a three attack chain like normal, normal power, normal, normal power here will hit a total of nine times. This will end up doing insane damage if you're leveling your mag and if you have materials. Until you have a lot of raw stats to back it up, the machine gun is just kind of mediocre most of the time. You'll find that there are a lot of enemies whose defense will basically make you do no damage. And where you might do like 80 damage with the sniper, you might be doing as little as like 15 or 20 with the machine gun bullet, and it's not as safe to use. I do want to draw attention to the fact that the machine gun really locks you into place, so it is incredibly punishing if you attack and whiff a target, or over attack, finish a combo, and don't kill your target. It leaves you really wide open. So people will generally prefer to play the pistol or sniper while playing the game at first, until they either find a machine gun with high accuracy to avoid that issue of, I really hope I don't whiff or I'll die. Um, so just keep that in mind. I think those are the important weapon types. Those are not the only weapon types in the game, but I will just draw attention that as you go through, before you come across any rares, these are the weapon types you'll be seeing pretty commonly. At least the ones you use for attack animations might be the best way to frame that. So, one additional thing we need to talk about for why certain weapons are chosen, which we'll be getting into in just a little bit, is that there are different weapon animations depending on if you're male or female, and sometimes classes have different weapon animations. So I'll give an example. Uh, males typically have a better swinging pattern with the saber, since it has like a faster final swing on the third hit. So it's a lot easier to do like, pow like normal, normal power and then retreat than it is for the females to do. However, you might notice that you might enjoy the female partisan animation a bit more than the males. The males, you might enjoy the sword animation more. Again, it's very much, you kind of just have to play around with it to an extent. But I'll draw out some ones that are probably more well-known and are, I would say, character-defining, whereas some of them are semi-subjective. So, male forces. We like to joke when you play a male force if you want to equip the best weapon the male force can use throughout the entire game, all the way to ultimate, simply go to your starting weapon that the game gives you and unequip it, <laughs> and you're already at ultimate level power. The reason is for this is that if male forces, so your Fomar, your Fonumen, cast spells without a weapon held, you cast faster. And given that weapons in this game do not really add a lot of mental power, and only a handful really boost your techniques, 
you will just completely outperform the females for, like, at least normal mode. So, keep that in mind. The faster cast animation is actually really important because at extreme high level, this allows you to get near perfect stun locks on enemies where the females cannot do so. So that's extremely important to know. Welcome, Chris. Definitely female slicers. Yeah. Welcome back. So definitely, we'll, we'll jump ahead slightly. So definitely with slicers, I do like the female slicer animation more. Specifically for Fomoral, for her shotguns, slicers, and double sabers, her animations are unique and really, really fast. Like, honestly, it feels like she's cheating, to <laughs> be real with you. Like, when you compare her animation speed, like, no joke, you would think that with the way she is attacking that she has something that improves attack speed, but no. She's just, in an attack animation that might take 40 or 50 frames for other characters, it might be like 30 for her, or 35. Like, it's ridiculous how fast it is in comparison. So you have like 20 extra frames to block and walk away. In a game that runs 30 frames per second, that's absolutely insane. I don't know why she's like that, and I think that's the Fomoral secret power. It's just being absolute nonsense. <laughs> like just, it, it is just so unfair how fast she is with those compared to other things. The shotgun animation in particular is insane. It, I think it's, we'll, we'll check the frame data maybe after the video, but I want to say it's like almost half. It's insane. She shoots it like a pistol speed instead of shotgun, which I forgot to mention earlier. Shotguns tend to have a big delay, so you'll go like, pew, 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 is like kind of like your typical shotgun speed. For full moral, it's pew, pew, pew. <laughs> like it just, it's it's not fair how fast it is, but yeah. So I just want to draw attention to that. Um, One other character known for their animations is the Huka Seal. So the Huka Seal's claws, daggers, and double sabers all have unique animations even separate from the female animations. So she will attack incredibly, incredibly fast with it. Daggers are almost her meta weapon because they are that powerful. So that's something to consider for late game. If you're deciding between certain weapon types, she is really, really, really good with these in comparison to the other weapons. So that's where she might have some specific hunts, which I don't think we'll talk about too much um or like claws for example but we'll talk a little bit about double sabers maybe a dagger hello this is post commentary ziggy stepping in and saying additional information on common weapons that might be useful regardless if you are a first time player or a returning player so i wanted to talk about a very common question since there's a lot of confusion as to what IDs potentially to pick for the common drops? So I've listed here the basic IDs that get a large bonus towards a particular drop. So notice that sabers, handguns, and canes all have a 13% chance of dropping regardless of ID. If you take a look at the sword, dagger, partisan, slicer, rifle, mech gun, and shots, there is one ID per weapon that has an advantage over the rest. So, Sky has Sword, Arn has Daggers, Blueful has Partisans, White Ill has Slicers, Green with Rifles, Purple Numb with Mech Guns, and Viridium with Shots. So I'm going to briefly show the full chart for people that are interested, if that information is not quite enough. Let me hide my notes. So for those looking to pick up a certain weapon type, uh, most of the rares in the game will also somewhat follow this pattern. So if you think you will be a giant sword user, or a dagger user, or a partisan user, potentially consider those IDs as safe choices. IDs are pretty subjective though, so we will probably have a different guide talking about that topic in particular. But I just wanted to talk about that. Now one thing I also wanted to mention is that there are up to five different attributes for a weapon. You have the native, A beast, machine, and dark, with the final attribute being hit. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you in the game a little bit of the information there. So let's hop over and showcase something. So I mentioned this in the guide itself. 
but I want to make sure that this is very clear. Do the person in front of me is known as a Tekker. You could kind of see if you look at the letters above the shop name, it actually does say Tekker, T-E-K-K-E-R. Uh, we'll be showing a little trick to improve your percentages, but essentially if you have a weapon that does not have hit percentage, you will see just the four basic attributes here. So one thing to kind of note for these different attributes is the fact that this percentage not only applies to your base weapon damage, but also to any bonuses. So you can see, for example, this is a plus 8 frozen shooter, this is a plus 40 spread needle. So those plus numbers are improved by the percentage. So every enemy has one of these types. So if I'm in forest, it'll be native. If I'm at, at the end of the game in ruins, it'll be dark, as an example. Um, and the grinder bonus you have will get multiplied by that in addition to the base strength of the weapon. If you were to look at the a wiki or an item resource guide, usually it's the lowest number, I believe, is considered the base or minimum ATP. So if you see a weapon has a range of damage, it just means that that low number is the thing that gets multiplied. However, one thing I want to draw attention to is that if we, just to showcase how we got here, if you hit F12 or the home key and go into the item pack and go to equip and you select the topmost icon, you can see weapons. Now, if you're looking to determine what the max possible roll is for a Tekker, so we'll showcase with the episode 1 slash episode 4 Tekker here, if we were to equip this, which I think is the easiest way to do it, but you can also do it just by looking at it and remembering the numbers. So I can see I have machine 20%, hit 5%. The Tekker can be up to plus 10% or minus 10%. So since I'm holding it, I'm expecting to get potentially a 30 and 15. So I rolled the best possible roll. So if I want to accept that particular uh, evaluation, I hit yes, otherwise you hit no. I just think it's really important to draw attention to this when we're talking about attributes, because whenever you're identifying something, it is so, so crucial that you try to uproll if it's even remotely useful. So for now, we'll identify, so that way we don't need to think about or worry about that between the guide. But let's talk about more specific things. So I'm gonna bop, or excuse me, pop back into the notes. In fact, we're going to hide that table for now, but we will be talking about that in just a moment. So with the different percentages, there's also one unspoken thing that I'm not sure many people know about. So we talked about the weapon space ATP and the grinders. But also, any armor or shield that grants attack power, which we will be going over those in the item list uh, within this particular video for the guide, also get improved by that multiplication. So if you end up with things like a combat gear that gives 35 ATP, for example, that will all get multiplied by potentially up to 100%. Now, I wanted to note that essentially... The percentages themselves are fairly straightforward. What might not be straightforward are units that add to your stats. Generally speaking, they cannot improve over your cap with very, very rare and noted exceptions. So for example, if your cap is hypothetically 1000 ATP, you're at 1000 ATP already and you add more power units, you cannot go over the cap. That is not true with shield and armor ATP or weapon damage. So that allows you to get over your cap. One thing that makes the hit percentage very powerful and why I recommend getting it on basically everything that you have that potentially will end up using a special attack uh, is the fact that every 1% is one accuracy. So we made a couple of comparisons throughout the guide where basically even in the best case scenario, in 10 levels, getting 7 ATA would be rare. So think about, mathematically speaking, having the equivalency of, what is it, 49, 50 levels worth of accuracy with very minimal investment. So it, it's, it's kind of nice. It's kind of nice. One thing, though, that stops you from getting completely out of control with the percentages, both the hit percentage and the attribute percentages, is a combination of things known as pattern selection and area chance. So what does that mean? 
So I'm going to give a link to the weapon attribute drop table. We were looking at portions of it earlier. We'll circle around to that after we go through the simplified guide. But essentially to break it down is the game will decide that depending on the difficulty and location, there is a natural cap to the highest percent modifier you can find. So for example, in forest, you will only find one attribute on a weapon, and at most, it can be 50% before identification. As you go further, roughly every three or so floors, roughly every new area, you're either going to add one additional attribute, or you're going to improve a prior attribute. So for people looking to do things like box runs, or you're looking to get common weapons, um, it's very much anticipated that you go to the endgame area, not necessarily for the rest of the item hunts, but because that actually does make a big difference on the potential rolls on a particular item. So one thing the game will also do is, because there are four uh, enemy types throughout the game, it will also weight the common weapons to be good against the area that you're in. It's not going to be guaranteed, but just know that that's how it works. If you're looking for stuff to be anti-forest, it's probably easier to find in forest. Or if you're playing areas with mixed IDs, those mixed IDs will generally still show up within the drops of the common weapons. One thing I do want to draw attention to is that even though there is this limitation of difficulty in area, or the maximum number of attributes, so up to three can be available on a weapon at any given time. The max percentage and number of attributes is always going to be the best possible pattern that it can roll from from the table. So we'll look at that at the end. But essentially what that means is rare weapons, regardless of where you get them from, potentially could drop with 90% hit. And if you tech it, which is what we did to identify the weapon, it could be 100% hit. So I just want to draw extra attention to that, that even if you're getting a weapon on normal, hard, very hard, it will still potentially outshine everything on ultimate if it is a decent carry weapon. So just draw attention to that. So I list here, for those that were curious, the rough odds of rolling hit percent if you do have an attribute. Notice it's pretty low, so it's somewhere between 1-5% to 5 of the time. And one additional thing I just want to mention, in terms of the rough scaling, if you go to basically, let's say, Mines 1, Jungle East, Crater North in Normal, versus do box runs in Hard Modes, Beginning Areas of Forest 1 and Temple Alpha, those will still be about on par with each other. So generally speaking, if you're looking for a better common weapon, it might be better just to go to the end game of any particular episode on a lower difficulty rather than the early game of a higher difficulty. So let's take a brief look at the charts themselves for people that are interested. I won't be including them in the guide since it's a bit more complicated, but this is just more for people that were curious. We're just going to spend a minute or so kind of glancing over the table. Let me go ahead and switch it back in so you can see what I'm looking at. Tied the notes. So for example, if we're looking at the potential tech rates, we're not really going to cover that within the guide, but just know that you have a higher chance of stuff being required to be identified, which is good in this game because it gets you a higher bonus. Just know it generally scales about 1 or 2% per floor. From the standpoint of the area percentages, we could see, for example, Forest is really heavily weighted towards native. The endgame area for episode one is heavily weighted towards dark, since those are the only enemies that show up. Just those kinds of common examples. One thing I'm talking about when I'm mentioning patterns and it's slowly going up, these are the technically the back end tables. All you need to really know is that in Forest, you're going to be going through most of this in normal difficulty. And the higher up you go, the better the starting pattern. So it isn't until you get into very hard mode that you will get the best possible drops of uh, lower seabed and tower. So all three attributes, in theory, could roll for triple 100s. So keep that in mind that you won't even see from a common weapon perspective really high hit percentage until you are at least in very hard seaside so don't 
don't hold out for 90 something percent drops prior to very hard mode or even honestly most of ultimate uh so one thing i am also going to talk about when we go back to the non-post commentary is high hit percentage so what do i mean by that if i were to give it a number i would generally say if it's a ranger it would probably be about 25 or 30 percent um, for what would work for them with specials, since they need less for them to land consistently. For characters like Hunters, I would say it's closer to 40%, and for Forces, I would say it's 50% or above. So, generally speaking, the Rangers don't need as much for specials to be great. Even in some cases, like the Ramar, you might be able to get away with 25% or even 20% hit, and still land a majority of your strikes. So just keep that in mind that it's somewhat based off the class, but if you hear me talking about weapons with hit percentage, it's slightly based off the character class that you have, but generally speaking, the higher the better. So one more thing I just want to mention that is also important to know for more when you enter ultimate than I would say your journey from normal to very hard, is if you do happen to get a weapon with at least 50% hit or more. There's actually several meta endgame weapons that potentially look at your hit percentage and or overall attributes. So I do want to denote that there are some items in this game that require a basic common weapon and you basically hold on to that weapon with the character class that can use it of a certain level and then you consume the component item associated with it. And when you do that, you copy all the attributes from that basic weapon over to the new ultimate rare. So I'm going to point out the names of just five items. I'm sure there are more, but these are the ones I was just thinking of offhand that I think were worth including uh, for the discussion purposes. So very, very meta endgame item. Dark Flow is a giant sword with the wand, which doesn't necessarily benefit from hit percentage as much as it actually benefits from uh, potentially things like machine percentage as a backup for uh, things like Bolt Op in Mines. Dark Meteor is another great example with hit percentage. There's also two, I would say, I'm going to call them off meta. They're not going to be considered best in slot for basically any character. But for people looking to explore either the utility or the gimmick of the weapon, you have Rainbow Baton and Egg Blaster. So I just want you to be aware of just a couple of options, both in the meta and non-meta sides of things, that if you have a really high hit percentage, and I'm talking really high, like if you somehow get a 70% and 80% in one of these weapon types, Please, please do not sell them. They can end up being they can end up becoming one of the most powerful things that your character has, depending on your character class. So keep that in mind that even if when we get into the weapon specials, if the hit percentage is really good, consider keeping it around just for potu uh, potential future items. So just be aware of that. So I'm going to briefly talk about weapon specials. So believe it or not, for people that are not familiar with the game, some of the best in slot weapons, as in the best you could possibly hold on to, uh, in the game are random unidentified weapons that have a weapon special. Not rares, just random floor drops. So I'm listing out what I would consider all of the specials in the game and why they are good or why people use it. That was gonna confuse me visually. So the big, the big three, the ones that are run-definingly powerful if the weapon has a hit percentage, Charge, Berserk, Spirit. What do these do? Well, Charge makes you pay money in order to use the special attack, but if it lands, massive damage. Berserk, instead of charging you money, costs you health, which is risky. Spirit costs you TP, which is annoying to refill, but is still very powerful. Cast cannot use it because they have no TP. Yeah, so if you have a high hit weapon of one of these, these will honestly be better than a majority of the rare weapons that you find. I'm not going to say all of them, and I'm definitely not going to say for ultimate level weapons. But honestly, like a charge mech gun in particular is just disgustingly broken. And multi-hit slicers like a berserk slicer or a spirit slicer are all extremely solid options for clear. 
So we'll talk about how to get some of these guaranteed 50 hits later on in the video for Affinia. For other people, you have to just kind of hope and pray, I would say. Because there's not, there's not a super consistent way without having access at least to episode 4. Yeah, yeah, charge is literally pay to win. Um, another one that's really good for multiplayer are Devils and Demons. What do these do? If you land a shot, it reduces them to a quarter or half of their current health. Let me flip that. Demons is stronger than Devils. That's why I want to be very clear with that. So it also allows for something called the Elemental Glitch, which we'll talk about. This is something I don't think we've really showcased much on stream since we skipped a lot of our early leveling. I did a lot of that off stream. But there are some very interesting glitches that are abusable with this. So we'll get to that in just a minute. I don't think a lot of people know about this. I think it was only talked about in the forums for Affinia maybe this year. I, I think it's something people observed but didn't understand why it happened. It wasn't until more recently it started getting talked about. Okay. One thing I want to do... Sorry about that, chat. I just want to make sure that this lines up in the notes to not confuse people. So probably the next most important one to get. So once you have your damage dealing ones or your I reduce you to half or quarter health, um, people will probably go for uh, the arrest series or bind hold season arrest. So depending on what keyword is on that weapon, it'll increase the percentage of it working. Which is something that's kind of annoying to have happen. It's not always consistent, unfortunately. Uh, but people will use this to shut down some mini-boss kind of enemies in Episode 1 and Episode 4 in particular. So it's kind of important to have. It's not needed when you're going through normal mode, let's say, or even most of hard mode. But honestly, very hard and ultimate, you're going to be abusing these specials all of the time. If you want to make life way easier, I really, really recommend you pick one of these up at some point. So we'll talk about a way you could get those towards the end of the item list. So just keep in mind that for now. If you happen to get a high hit percentage one of these, it's generally good. But one thing I, I think I skimmed over, sorry. Uh, if you don't have a rare weapon version of it, if you have, for example, an Arrest Slicer, unless it's a rare slicer, it's going to cut the activation rate in by a third. So instead of 80%, it'll be a third of 80%. So if you don't want to have it reduced, for example, it's very popular for Charge Berserk and Spirit Mech Gun to exist because it ignores this. Things like pistols and snipers are really great for devils and demons, as an example, or even a rest. I just want to draw attention to that. It's something I kind of skimmed over by accident. Um, probably more important for player. So chaos is kind of the same thing. Instead of paralysis, it's confused. Just be aware that people use certain units to boost the status chance of it working. V501 and V502, I think, are not in the original PSO people playing on GameCube that will not apply to you. However, when you're making new characters in particular, and you're able to get one of these units, which we'll talk about how to get in a little bit, uh, this series of Dim, Shadow, Dark, and Hell is really useful for clearing Episode 2 in particular. It unfortunately requires a lot of game knowledge to know what enemies have a weakness towards it. So I recommend if you haven't gone through and added add-ons in Affinia that you do that as soon as possible or get ready to learn per difficulty what enemies you could very easily insta-kill, which I don't recommend as much. So this is probably a must if you're playing Episode 2. If you're just starting the game playing Episode 1, it's not as relevant. <clears throat> However, that does open up options if you start a new character over with a hell ray gun, let's say, for example, which is a type of pistol, uh, it does open up new leveling options that you would not normally ever do with a fresh character, since it makes the game a lot easier. Now, there is the Ice to Blizzard series. Unfortunately, due to it having a 40% max cap of working, which is something I didn't realize it had for a long time, it's unfortunately just not as good as the other ones. 
I, I don't really recommend using a weapon that only works 40% of the time. That's kind of a big risk compared to paralysis, which could be almost guaranteed. Uh, we'll talk about the elemental glitch in a moment, but the heat to burning, the shock to tempest series should all allow you to do the elemental glitches. HP drain, I don't generally recommend. Some people use it on like the final fight of falls just so they can heal in solo play. I think that's the only real example I can think of where people would actively use this. Otherwise, just carry more healing items. TP Drain is really good. I would say not from normal and hard, but probably from very hard to ultimate. Uh, where your forces finally have accuracy. They can use this as an alternative over carrying like 10 mono fluids and 10 die fluids. So they can just focus on holding tri fluids, which max out their TP. So they can free up an item slot that way. I'll denote that that's the meta use. If you have a TP Drain item, it lets you get away with holding only one set of fluids instead of three. You gain one additional slot in your bag. And sadly, Experience Steel is really, really, really nerfed in Affinia. I don't recommend it at all. If you're playing regular GameCube, it was a very popular thing to do to take a gun or a weapon with low damage into Episode 2 to go to Seabed specifically. And where there were the robo boxes that spawn the little robot sentries that fight you, you would just XP steal on them over and over and over again and do like literally almost no damage to the boxes. That way it would be like every, every combo more or less would be a kill and the enemy wouldn't fight back because the robot box doesn't do any damage directly. So that's what it was used for. In Affinia, I don't think it has a use, and it's generally just much worse than other options. If you're at the point where you have a good XP steal item, I still don't think it's worth using, to be honest with you. Like, the only thing I can think of is if you're getting hard carried, and you're just looking for bonus XP when your friend kills everything. That would literally be it. <laughs> just... Otherwise, for solo play... So, I credited Spuzz in the Affinia Discord for this. I don't know if somebody mentioned it before Spuzz, but most of these notes were taken from what he mentioned in the Discord. Or they mentioned, I should say, they mentioned. Um, so, here, here's what it is, the elemental glitch. So, normally, the elements just do very low damage. They're kind of disappointing. I think the intent was, like... If an enemy is high defense, you're supposed to use elemental damage to hurt them, which sounds really cool in theory. The problem with PSO is that elemental resistance is so high that it basically does no damage and is generally never worth using ever, sadly. And it also scales based off your level rather than some of your other stats, so it's not really strong for a majority of the game. So it's really, really hard to recommend you ever use these, except if you're going for the elemental glitch. So how does it work? Well, if you are fighting an enemy with multiple parts, not necessarily all of them, but some of them, if you tag them with the elemental shot, and then you hit them with something that actually does damage, so you do a special attack, and then you do, let's say, a power attack afterwards, what'll happen is that every single part of the boss or a uh, large enemy that was tagged with this elemental special will receive the damage of the next hit to all of those parts. So what does this mean? This means like as a force for boss fights or certain enemies that you don't do a lot of damage on, you can actually just tag an, an enemy with this special every now and then and basically just double the hunter or the ranger's damage. This is incredibly useful prior to ultimate if your team doesn't have a lot of DPS. In particular, forces can struggle a lot with dealing any kind of reasonable damage to certain enemies. So being able to tag them in a way to help other people do damage is kind of insane. I would say the most game-changing one of all the things that it works on is Olga Flow. So apparently, Tat, if you tag Olga Flow with elemental shots, and you have a ranger or hunter in your party, your force basically could just do free hunter-ranger level damage every time they land special. Which is insane, given how little damage you do as a forest in Episode 2. 
So this is like one of those actually meta, actually useful things to do. So again, this is something that I don't think was talked about until more recently. I'm crediting Spuzz. It's possible other people definitely before Spuzz mentioned it. This is just how I learned of it. I just, I just went, oh, interesting video that was shared and talking about the, of why this happens. Interesting. So it can apparently also apply to Del Lilies, Lilies in general, and the Gerdabulu, sort of. So, important to know, we might experiment with this a bit more in the future, in particular if we do more Ogaflow fights. I actually just don't have any elemental weapons anymore to really try this. But maybe in the future, if I'm re-rolling random uh, rares, I think, I'll, I think I'll hold on to one just to try it out. I think this will be pretty useful for the faux neural in particular, since her accuracy is really high. So she's more likely to land that special with the added 10 to 12 accuracy over her counterparts. Since 12% accuracy is pretty huge, given that it scales on the second and third hit in particular. So, I'm gonna put that in my back pocket for now. We'll, we'll be on the hunt for some of those items in the future. And finally, the last thing that has to deal with glitches and why certain attacks are incredibly, incredibly broken, and why it's important to know about this. So normally, special attacks have a huge accuracy penalty. That is supposed to be the balancing mechanic of PSO, so you can't just special, special, special. You're basically only going to land at most the third hit, and maybe sometimes the second hit if you have really, really high accuracy. It's almost impossible to land the first hit on most characters, in particular if you're not max stat, if you're not taking units to improve accuracy, etc, etc. However, there is a glitch in the game. People call it the SNS glitch, some people just call it the SN glitch. So what is it? You take a weapon like a slicer, you take a weapon like a machine gun. You stand a pretty big distance away from the enemy. You need to fire that attack. So if it's a machine gun, boom boom boom. Slicer, you chuck it. Before that special attack lands, you need to tap the normal attack button. And you're like, okay, so why why does that matter? So PSO only keeps track of one accuracy modifier at a time. So what does that mean? When you fire your special attack and it hasn't landed, and then you fire a normal attack afterwards, it's gonna recognize that you did a normal attack second, right? It was the most recent attack. So it's gonna forget that it's that you threw a special attack. However, this special attack still has the properties that it did when it was used. When you throw that slicer, it still has the special. However, if you're able to do a normal attack before the special lands, when it goes to calculate the hit against the target, it's going to use the normal attack accuracy, aka the most accurate attack you could do in the game. So suddenly, <laughs> suddenly those really hard to hit specials, you could just chain them more or less. You do special normal, special normal or if if you're more comfortable with the timing you do special normal special so what you could do for this in order to make sure that you don't accidentally mess it up is you can actually do special normal and when the normal attack is coming out you can actually open a menu or hit the pause button to cancel the projectiles that are shot from the normal attack and then do another special attack so what that'll do is it'll mean you'll get, as a machine gun, six attacks. If you get a slicer, it's two attacks. You get two attacks that are using the second normal attack's accuracy because it's waiting for that attack to land, but it never lands. And it confuses the game. It's a beautiful thing. So I recommend you practice this in particular with uh, at least special normal version. This, the SNS is a bit harder to do uh, without accidentally shooting too quickly. You need to practice that glitch more. Yeah, it's really, really good. It requires a minimum distance. You can't do it point blank because you need to make sure special does not connect. It's also technically... I didn't know this was possible. It's also technically possible to do with daggers and twin swords. I thought that was interesting. That was something I learned while doing the item guide. I knew you could do it with slicers and machine guns. So, for example, if you have a, a hell slicer or a demon slicer on a rare weapon that just triggers on multiple enemies you could just wham get that normal accuracy on all of them and destroy them super fast but using a combination of the pause 
tricked in order to stop your attack from coming out and or making sure you're at max distance to like the first part of a two part move whiffs. You can interestingly also do the glitch on Dagger and Twin Swords. I don't know how useful it is on Dagger and Twin Swords. I will state from personal experience and watching people play that Slicer and Machine Gun is absolutely the thing that you should practice it on. The other ones I would say are probably more niche. I will let you know it is possible. At some point on stream, we will try drag Dagger and Twin Sword. It's hard to tell if this one's working correctly. It's very easy to tell if Slicer Machine Gun is working correctly. Because if you're using Machine Gun and all three specials hit, that's how you know it worked. Because normally it will never ever do it. It's just so... It's just so inaccurate normally. So anyway, those are just going through some glitches that are good to know and why certain things are meta. Do you have a little bit of an understanding of where we're going with what items I'm going to recommend as you play through the game? So... Let's talk about item etiquette. So these are things that you need to think about when you're playing the game in order to do better with your party members and also just get into the right mindset of PSO. So I want you to get into this item, item mindset with uh, every time you pick something up, you should ask yourself a series of questions. When you pick up a random unidentified weapon, Is it a useful weapon type? So, let's say you have an unidentified ray gun. And it has demons. Then you want to continue. If it's a machine gun with demons, you skip it. So you don't even bother looking at it, you just know it's trash. I'm just telling you straight up, you have to get into this mindset for late game. But then you look at the items. So it's like, okay, you have a demon pistol. Okay, does it have hit percentage? If the answer is yes, you might just end up using it right then and there for like the rest of the game. Because like honestly, these are literal, literal potential endgame items. Please make sure to check to see if it is hit percentage. So, one thing you can kind of check is if you have two demon guns and you're not sure which gun is better. The easiest way to tell most of the time is does it have more stars than the one that you have before? Do you have a two-star handgun, a three-star handgun, or a four-star handgun? And if they are within 5% hit, the more stars will be more relevant. If it's like 15 or more percent hit, then the star rank is not as relevant. That's kind of like the rough thing you have to think about. For armor, it's very simple. Does it, for an armor or frame, which is the thing you wear at your party, does it have slots for units? Units are one of the biggest driving factors in power level in this game. If you have really good units, they will carry you throughout the game. So we're going to teach you very easy ways to get those units. So that way you can end up getting 50 power, 50 mind, attack speed, potential cast cost reduction, status ailment chance up. All these potential things could be on your character. And the best part about units in particular is that they have no level requirement. So if you have a level 1 frame with 4 slots, you could use everything you got in very hard mode and ultimate immediately on a new character. I cannot stress to you how good this is when you're making new characters. I cannot I cannot emphasize this enough. The number of slots a armor frame has is like more than exponential. It's basically a vertical line <laughs> at a certain point of how good it is. I will take a level 1 frame when starting a new character over that has 4 slots over a level 60 required to use armor that only is 1. Like, that is how good it is. Like, I, I will not even care at all what the de defense and evade is if I could get 4 slots. Now, when you're starting the game, you don't have many units. I'm going to say that's kind of the inverse. If all you're doing is picking up some, like, knight powers, which I think give 5 attack power, for example, those are not really game-changing units. So... I, I could see the argument that you're like, I'm new to the game, I'm going to take damage, I should take this. It's going to flip by the time you're in very hard... At least by the end of very hard mode, it should have flipped. By ultimate, it absolutely does not matter what your defense is at all. You, it, you could literally walk around with no armor. It, it, it shouldn't matter at that point if you've been gearing up properly. Um, one other common thing that comes up are there are items called grinders. So there's mono grinders, die grinders, and tri grinders. So... My philosophy is, is if you're not sure, just use it or sell it, but don't sit on it. It's pretty easy to get these throughout the game. There's a lot of quests that reward these. 
in particular if you have access to Affinia in Episode 4. So, I think it's more important that you get two or three extra damage a swing while doing, like, a boss fight, for example, than to hold it and then be like, ha, oh, I saved five minutes in Ultimate. Like, it just... I, I, I don't I don't think it's relevant. I'll put it that way. If if it's stopping you from getting upgrades for your mag or stopping you from getting a technique, you should absolutely sell the grinders. They're they're good, but not like I should always save all of them levels of good. Um one other thing is when you're starting off the game, please make sure to check the shop before and after a quest. The shop will offer some basic techniques that are levelless for new forces. So common ones are like Ryuker or Reverser are really good shop finds. So you want to refresh the shop as often as possible to get some of those where it doesn't really matter what level the technique is, it's really good. Another good one for like rangers and hunters in particular that are humans, in addition to forces, is Resta. Please get Resta shifted D-band Zalor Jelen if your characters could get them. It almost doesn't matter what level they are. Preference on shift to D-band on low levels versus uh, Gel and Zalora for debuffs. Um, one thing that is, I would say, a common courtesy if you're playing with a group of people, especially for longer quests, please pick up Trifluids for your forces. Don't be that person that just ignores them. Especially when you're playing through, like, normal to very hard, where fluids are really expensive items for forces. So if they're partying with you and supporting you, you're saving them, like, potentially 3k every time you pick this up. Which in normal mode is insane. <laughs> like, this is actually insane money save. Please pick them up when you're playing with your friends. Please don't ignore them. Your, your force is very poor. That is pretty much what holds them back as, like, a first character. They need money in order to do well, and they need it way more than you ever will as a hunter or a ranger. You will not know what it is like to be bankrupt unless you play a forest for the first character. Similarly, if you want to have your cast have extra healing options, in particular for harder boss fights, please do not ignore star atomizers for your cast. This is an AoE heal that full heals everybody near them. This is really powerful in hard, very hard in particular, where your force may or may not die due to the fact that boss damage is fairly high. So giving your cast the ability to full heal the entire team is kind of crazy. So it will help you potentially if you're playing with the people of your level. So please do not skip those items. And finally, one of the most important ones when it comes to group play. Bring Moon Atomizers to revive your team. I'm gonna say it again. Bring Moon Atomizers to revive your team. Chat, please don't forget to bring Moon Atomizers to revive your team. You can't... If, if the person with Reverser, like the Force, dies, and your character falls in a boss battle, you are just going to make the game take so much longer because you decided not to be a friend to <laughs> take Moon Atomizers to revive your teammates. There is a lot of jank in PSO. It's not even necessarily a skill issue, quote unquote, with the other characters. There is just sometimes nonsense that will one-shot a player. Like there there are raw casts with 2000 health that die instantly. So it's it's not even it's not even necessarily like they have bad gear or whatever. Like it's just PSO is jank. So bring items to counter the jank in multiplayer play. In single player, you can leave these at home, you don't need these. But please make sure to bring moon atomizers for people with you, it makes life so much easier. Um, friendly reminder, just make sure whenever you're starting a quest to always check to see in normal and hard, you just need mono and die mates. In very hard and ultimate, you'll be mostly using trimates or trifluids. Just make sure to restock your healing. Don't be the person that enters a boss fight with zero mono fluids as a force. Don't be that person. Go back to town. So, speaking of go back to town, I would say it's everybody's job to do this, but unless everybody agrees ahead of time, somebody needs to learn Ryuker, which is a way to go back to town, and casts in particular need to bring Telepipe. I, I don't want to hear excuses. Unless, unless you guys have literally agreed, and girls have talked about, you know, to save slots so that way more people can hold more items. Unless that is the specific discussion that you've had with them, 
There is no reason for people not to learn Ryuker. No reason not to bring telepipes. Don't be that person. Don't go in the middle of the quest and realize, oops, I'm out of healing resources, and oops, there's no way to go back. Don't do that. Um, finally, one thing with item etiquette, and this is important, especially if you're giving items to other players. Please make sure you check to see what the original bonuses of a weapon are. So I'll give an example. You might have an unidentified gun that when you look at it, it says 30% native. If you identify this, you could get up to 40% native or 10% more than what it exists. Don't identify it and give them a 25 native or a 20 native instead. You're basically just ruining the weapon due to a... I'm going to call it an annoying mechanic. I don't particularly like this mechanic, but please be aware. The Tekker, the reason why you can reject his identification, is that you can get up to that 10% bonus. So please make sure that if you find a good item for your friend or you're trading between people, please don't identify it at the base rate, because you're making the weapon just much worse than it should be. And this is important too for hit percentage. So for example, if you find a 40% hit, you could make it as low as 30% hit, which is arguably not worth using on certain specials, or 50% hit, which is amazing. So please, please make sure to check the original percentages on a weapon before you identify. Now, if you're just looking to junk it, it doesn't matter. Just identify once, doesn't matter, sell it, not worth re-identifying. Anyway, that's it with item etiquette. So before we go into the massive, massive list of different ways you could get items, we'll talk about some very quick honorable mentions, where we will not go into massive details for them. Mags. We mentioned before, Mine 1, Mine 2, Jungle Area East, Mountain Area. If you're playing Athenia, this is how you find the other color mags. I've listed all the difficulties here. Note, I also put ultimate mode because a lot of the times if you're doing a box run, you kill very little to low enemies, so it doesn't really matter what you bring with you. Just note that. Just note it. If you want to find those rare colors, that's where you do it. Otherwise, just create another character with the color of your choice, move that mag via the bank or through trading to another character to receive that item. Uh, we mentioned grinders a bit earlier. These drop as random drops everywhere. Technically, on lower difficulties, enemies can drop grinders, but this is not the way that you find grinders. Just play the game. You'll, you'll end up with a lot. Similar to materials, just play the game. You'll, you'll end up with a lot. If you're fighting, you're not getting materials of a certain type. It probably just means that that specific floor does not drop it. So some will drop a lot of power. Some will drop a lot of mind. Defense tends to be shared, and luck tends to be very rare. This is like a general rule of thumb. Photon drops. Photon drops technically drop as guaranteed drops on normal mode in some areas, but that's not how you farm them. This is another one. Just play the game. You'll end up with a lot. Uh, I think in the future we'll try a series of quests and we'll have a separate video uh, discussing the best way to get photon drops per second, which just means how fast can you kill a lot of enemies is the best way to translate it. Uh, one, one other item of note is scape dolls. Again, technically it drops as a rare for some enemies in normal mode. There are other ways to get the scape dolls. You will get them naturally as random drops in boxes. What this does means is if you die, you get revived. You recover full health, full TP. And if you're a cast, you get all of your traps back. So there's a lot of situations where you might die on purpose to get the full refill. In particular, cast getting the trap recovery is pretty huge. So just keep that in mind. You'll pick up a lot of these throughout the game. I recommend just storing any spares in your bank if possible, so that way you can hoard up for the harder areas. You can also sell them for money. They're, they're worth no pay amount. Again, you'll be requiring literally hundreds as you play the game. Um, I'm not going to go into detail to get all of the different combinations of amplifiers and barriers, which are box hunts that I would recommend prior to Ultimate in particular. We're basically only going to talk about how to get the strong amplifiers later. So for those that don't know what I'm talking about here, essentially there's a force item that says if you have a, let's say, a red barrier, which corresponds to red spells, and you have an amplifier of Rifoe or Gafoe, which are the advanced tech and the intermediate tech, respectively, for fire, and you combine them together, you will end up with something that boosts the damage by 30% of a specific tech, 
or if you use one that is an amplifier of red, it generically gives 20% to all the techniques. So obviously a 20 to 30% bonus is pretty huge, um, given that defense is not super, super relevant as you play the game, especially as you get more used to the game. So I will talk about how to get the strong ones. I will mention that there are other types for those that are aware. But honestly, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be real 1000% honest with you. Box hunts are mostly tedious, and there are so so many box hunts. I I, I could spend literally hours talking about all the different box hunts. Like for any given amplifier, it could show up in like five different areas, on like 10 different IDs, but then it's on different difficulties as well. And those show up in different areas compared to the other difficulties. It's a mess. It's an absolute mess. So I'm going to try to keep it as simple as possible for people trying to get into the game. I will try not to subject you to that wall of ridiculous ones. I don't think you've ever done box hunts before. Some of them are kind of done on kind of in combination with other things. So I'll give an example for Chris. We've technically been doing box hunts for specific amplifiers. I just haven't told you. So what will happen is if if something is in like episode two in particular, there might be something I'm interested in amplifier wise, and we will be hunting something else that is more important to get in terms of power. But technically box drops are really good. I would say the only other time where we do a combination that you've done all the time and haven't realized you've done is anytime we've played white ID, force and ultimate, um, all those boxes can drop an armor called 13, from what I recall, and or the Crimson Coat. So we, while going for other rares, are technically box hunting most of the time. I just don't usually draw attention to it. There are ones that are pure box hunt runs only, and those usually involve running Seabed, for those that are aware. Yeah. This, this Seabed one is something you do solo. I, I would never do a group box run because there would be no purpose group level doesn't impact box hunts so they're not usually fun to do in groups but anyway i'll leave it there yeah because because some because some box hunts though chris just so you aware are actual like real runs on top of that like here's an example if all you're looking for is far as two boxes technically the beginning beginning of ttf is a box hunt like, think of it that way. You've done TTF a lot. It's it's not that different. You just have to be on a specific character and a specific ID. Which is kind of funny when you think about it. You kill one enemy and then you check the five boxes reset. That's it. Just over and over. It's very tedious. And that's why I don't super recommend it for newer players. But for people that are looking to get that edge from very hard to ultimate, these are the kinds of things you want to go back for. Yeah, they're, they're, not, they're not really. <laughs> so... Let's talk about some other items as you play. So all these are specific to Affinia, so if you don't play on Affinia, then I'm sorry, but this section will not pertain to you. So there are things called event eggs that drop during the Easter event. We'll be talking about later how to cash them in with a quest called the Egg Shop. So stay tuned for that at the end of our video. We're not gonna cover quests. We're only gonna cover shop quests specifically at the very end of the video. Um, but essentially, these can net some really awesome items. Halloween cookies are needed for entry to Halloween quests, which give a 100% boost to rare raid, XP, and rare monster, which is extremely good for some late game hunts. I actually recommend you don't even use cookies at all until ultimate, to be honest with you, because they are just so powerful and so good at getting items that you need from specific areas. Um, Christmas presents, if you get them, you should use immediately. You get an item based off your difficulty. Simple enough. Um, there's no real strategy to it other than farming high numbers of enemies. And the Christmas event is active. And finally, we have the badges. So there's bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. Bronze you can get even if you're playing as a fresh character level 1 during the anniversary event, which is... Actually, can chat fact check me when the anniversary event was? I did not write it down. But usually it's in the fall, right before the Halloween event. So what'll happen is that bronze, you could get a normal. If you manage to get to very hard or ultimate, you get silver. And if you get to ultimate, you get gold and platinum. Platinum are like the uber rare items, like the basically, not best in slot, but definitely the hardest to acquire items in the game. So if you get that, 
You save a whole bunch of time with it. And essentially, these badges can be traded for materials, items, etc. Oh, I'm going to have to skip this song. Wow, we've been talking so long, I actually went through basically the whole soundtrack. This is going to be quite a video. Strap in, chat. The 5th of August, the 5th of September was where it was active. Thank you, Chris. So we are not going to focus on those for now. Just know that just playing the game normally during these events will get you these items. And just be aware that a majority of these, with the exception of the Christmas present, need another quest to use. Just be aware of that. From the standard gameplay, which would probably be available in more servers, during like Christmas, Halloween, and Easter, there are also Christmas presents not to be confused with present parentheses Christmas. I know, ridiculous. Jack-o'-lanterns and Easter eggs. These basically give you access to kits and cells, which we talked about before are used to level your mag. This would be the traditional way you would get these. Easter eggs also give you potentially joke weapons. So for people looking to collect very goofy items, it's probably the item of your choice. Now I'm going to talk about one of the most important things ever. I'm going to push the gamble agenda here. I realized I was slightly cut off. I'm going to have to, I'm going to, have to leave it slightly cut off. Sorry. So I think from our standpoint, uh, what are what are the gambles? So if you play multiplayer, so in Affinia you just select a normal game versus a solo play game. There is a man that stands outside the shop. Now for a thousand Masetta, which is a little bit high in normal mode, but by very hard, a thousand Masetta is not very difficult to come across whatsoever. The video stuttering, stop that. Sorry, John. I got bothered because the music just like paused itself for no reason. Good job, YouTube. You did it. Let's try that again. So for as just a thousand in cash, which is not very hard to get towards the tail end of hard mode and most of very hard and obviously definitely not in ultimate mode, you could get some of the strongest items honestly in the game that will hard carry you instantly. So this is regardless of what difficulty you're on. This is stuff you could do right now. I really, really recommend you check out the Corin's prize list. So from our perspective, there is the from Sunday. So keep in mind on Athenia specifically, it swaps over midway through the day to the next day because it uses the Greenwich in which time, the GMT. So keep that in mind. So just be careful depending on what time. Just just check just check what day it is <laughs> in the server. Check what day it is in the server. Um, but by default, for a thousand Masetta, potentially your first a thousand Masetta, you could get a unit called the God Power, which adds 50 ATP to your character. So if you just spent, let's say, hypothetically, between 100,000 and 200,000 Masetta, which is a tall order, I would say, for a normal mode character, but not so much for a hard mode or very hard mode character, you can end up with the equivalency of basically a fully leveled mag, as long as you have free open slots and skip like 60 levels worth of power just by having money, which is crazy. This is like actually bonkers how good this is for new players, especially if they're hunters or rangers. So early on in the game, this might be as much as doubling your power. And this is going to make the game way, 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 way easier. Now I'm going to point out some other units that are worthy if you happen to get the alternate rares and the 1k gambles. Um, Cure Paralysis, Shock and Freeze are all really great things to have. I would say more for Ultimate than I would say the earlier difficulties. As mostly, for example, the flowers that poison in Episode 1 are way more annoying in Ultimate mode. But these are things that once you acquire them will carry you in Ultimate. So these are things you might not use in every single run, in particular for lower difficulties, but having them makes the higher difficulties so much easier. So if you manage to pick these up here, great. Uh, if you gamble on Monday or Saturday, there's something known as the Three Seals. This is an absolutely bonkers, completely unfair item. Let me, let me load it up so the people are aware. Let me scroll so I can see what it gives to you. 
So as a requirement of only being level 33, which you could reasonably achieve in hard mode, you get 33 to all resistances. Completely insane. Totally, totally insane. This is higher than almost everything in the game. The defense value, not really great. Evade, not really great. Basically, it will... They give a number range here. You could ignore this. It'll always be 33 since you got it from a, a quest. And on top of that, it gives a 30% boost of damage to Resond. The only downside is you very slowly lose health as you move around. But the additional trade-off is that it will randomly auto-block for you. So you'll see the word resist in like a light blue pop up when this occurs. And this will block things that normally would have hit you. So that's how you know that it is working. It only wor That only applies to physical attacks for clarity. But this is just an absolutely insane thing. So as soon, like it, in theory within 10,000, I mean, it's, it's not, let me check the gamble odds. The gamble odds are one in 200. So in 200,000, you're likely to get it. You could get it as early as your first 10 attempts. So to get something that is basically literally almost best in slot, or at least it's best in slot for uh, Resond, and it gives you super resistances, and it helps you block. And I guess I'll scroll slightly so people can see what it looks like. Um, it is a really, really crazy pickup. Like, to me, it's just so silly how powerful it is. So, on Monday, you can also, while gambling for this, get God Mind, which, if you're a force, getting 40 MST is huge, given that you get less than 7 a level up. So, again, we're, tr we're trying to put these numbers in perspective. If you're getting 7 or less a level up, you're getting almost the equivalency of, what is that, about 6 levels worth of stats per unit. So you can very easily be stronger than the area intended. So if normal mode is 0 to 20, hard is 20, 20 to 40, uh, very hard is 40 to basically 80, if you want to think of it that way. Being able to jump 5 or 6 levels per unit is crazy. So with just 3 of these, it's like you're playing on a totally different difficulty. Another exceptional pickup with these 1k gambles are the god arms. So for 1,000 while trying to get three seals as a backup, you could get 15 to accuracy, which is completely insane. Some characters don't even gain... So in 10 levels, you might not even gain 7 accuracy on most classes. So you could gain potentially the equivalency of 20 or more levels of accuracy per unit, which is completely unfair, as you can hear. So these are really, really powerful pickups. There's a kind of a niche pickup where there's something called PP Create or Photon Blast Create. So let me double check the rate for you real quick so I'm not talking nonsense. So it generates one Photon Blast every 23 seconds, usable by all classes, of course, because most units are. If you just have really low-end units, like let's say you just have regular Knight's Power, or you might only have like maybe a general HP... And it doesn't matter as much. Sometimes just getting Myla Eula with the Magblast or Estella faster is better. And especially if you're ever going to step away from the game for a little bit. Like, if you're playing GameCube and you're like, oh, I gotta do lunch or whatever. Just, if you pause the game, you might as well just put this on and be at max Photon Blast for later. So it has niche uses. Just keep that in mind. Having Photon Blast is great. This is also pretty good. I would say it's less niche on forces since they cannot generate Photon Blast without attacking with physical attacks. Techniques, unfortunately, do not build it. I don't think I mentioned that before, but we're going to mention it here. So this is one of the few ways that they could potentially max a Photon Blast during a quest by stacking these units. Most units can stack. I will designate or denote when they cannot stack, and I will also probably update the notes to state this. But PB Create can be stacked, God Arms can be stacked, God Mind can be stacked, God Power can be stacked. There's no point to stacking Cure Paralysis, since the first first one gives you immunity, so just be aware. Uh, for people looking to have survival uh, against bosses, in particular with really high set damage, if you gamble 1k on Tuesdays, you could go for God HP. Getting 80 hit points early is pretty crazy, given that uh, some forces don't even hit like 1000 health until level 100 plus. So being able to gain potentially 240 health uh, in normal mode is bonkers. 
completely bonkers. To them, that might be like almost like a 100% health increase. In particular for the phone new rule, it is really crazy to get it on low difficulties, where you might get less than 5 HP on phone new rule. Like, casts, I think, get upwards of 10, so that it's less important for them. But to get potentially, you know, 7, 10, 13 levels of HP per unit, pretty good if all you're looking to do is survive set damage from bosses. Uh, sadly, there is really nothing worth it on Wednesday worth gambling. Everything you can gamble on Wednesday, you can also gamble on the other days and get better stuff with it. So just, just don't gamble on Wednesdays, it's, it's not worth it. Now here's one that's extremely good. God Technique. This one says, let's say you are a force, you're starting the game, you have level 7 Foey. You put a God Technique on, it's now level 10 Foey. You put another God Technique on, it's level 13 Foey. You put another God Technique on, it's now level 16 Foey. So until you hit the cap of your class, which is 30 for forces, 20 for females, and 15 for males, generally speaking, across the board. Um... If you hit certain thresholds, like going beyond level 20 techniques, for example, or going from level 10 to level 15, the spells will start receiving animation differences, so they'll be more efficient. And the more levels a technique has, not only does it improve damage, but it reduces the amount of time uh, that you have to wait between spells. So you mostly do this to reduce that big lag between spells, and it makes you chain them more safely. So having, a, so having a god technique is considered best in slot for a class. Because getting to level 30 techniques is insanely difficult in this game. It's basically an uber rare drop. It will not really happen for a very long time. Especially not for every spell. You might get a level 30 technique uh, outside of the support skills. Like maybe every 100 hours or so of gameplay. Like I'm going to give you that kind of rough estimate. But yeah... So being able to turn very common level 27 drops into level 30s, for example, is the meta of the endgame. But even when you're leveling a character, having higher level shifted D-band for your friends is just more damage that your team can do and the less that they take. Just really good, really good stuff to have in general. Um, the backup to the three seals one and something that you could do in general that I think is good for all classes. So we'll skip Friday because it just says PB Great and Pure Shock. Um, the Saturday one. God ability. This one gives you 2 to accuracy, but more importantly, 20 to all stats. So if you're playing kind of a hybrid character, or you're looking for only a little bit of accuracy, since you have enough god arms, or you're really good with other abilities, uh, god ability is a really solid unit slot filler. It will generally be better than anything you can find uh, prior to very hard mode. And honestly, for the most part, in ultimate, you'll still probably use a couple of these. So just be aware of that. Actually, Chad, I don't see something here that I'm looking for. One moment as I pop up and check the list. There should be a devil battle. I don't think it's worth gambling for specifically. It's more of like a... We'll call it a consolation prize. I'm just looking to see where devil battle is. Oh, devil battle is on Monday. Okay. I don't think I put that... This is a unit that grants 10% attack speed. It's okay. I'm gonna list it as niche. I I wouldn't I wouldn't go for this specifically. It's a nice to have, but it's not as game changing as the other ones are. I think that's also available. I think every day you could get a three seal. You can also get it on, like, the Friday run. There we go. I'll just add that in there for the, the team reference. For people that are looking for an attack speed up, these are the ones that probably would interest you. So I think that covers all the major items. Now I'm going to put in uh, uh, an honorable mention. So if you're wondering what money is used for in the end game, for the most part on the Infinia server, it's the 100k gambles. There's a unit called V101 that you can gamble on Sundays for 100,000. Which is very, very expensive. I do not expect you to do this in very hard. Just honorable mention is it gives one and a half accuracy to your character, which you're like, okay, 15 to all other stats. And you're like, okay, well, that doesn't sound better than God ability. And then you read the next line 40% attack speed. Broken. 
Best in slot, every character uses it, it's amazing. However, don't save up for one 100k gamble if you're starting the game. Please potentially save money to feed your mag, and then if you have a lot left over, then consider the 1k gambles. Because again, it, getting a 3 seals as a force at level 33 on hard mode is really great. Getting god power and god arms is really great for rangers and hunters. God mind is really great for forces. There's a lot of things in here that I would consider game changing for the difficulty. I, I would recommend you do the 1k gambles over the 100k gambles. I will not mention the 10k gambles. I think they are... There are better ways to get the stuff that are in the 10k gamble. Honestly, I don't think they're worth it. If you happen to pick up a random item from the 100k gamble that's a 10k, it might be good. I'm not going to throw it out there, but I'm not going to consider that meta. I don't expect people to do 10k gambles. I don't think there's an excuse for when you're in very hard, if you're playing Affinia, that you don't do the 1k gamble. You're put, you're leaving so much power behind on the table, it's unreal. So I, I don't want to hear excuses, chat. Do, do your 1k gambles. <laughs> so anyway. So let's talk about different things that you could do in normal mode. So you're a fresh character. What are things that you could potentially go for? We'll start off with the red barrier, so just put a little pop-up here. So you don't really use it as is. It's a pretty bad item. Like, it only gives, like, potentially at most 7 defense, which is hilariously terrible. When we compare that, we'll scroll down to basic barrier so you can ex reference it. So literally, the starting shield of the game is better than red barrier, which is what I think confuses new players in particular to see you're like, wow, that's really terrible. Um, but remember, if you combine that with the amplifier that we saw before, then it becomes one of the best in slot for forces. If you happen to pick these up, just give them to your force friend. They're f somewhat useful. I'm not going to list out every single ID. I want to more talk about the item themselves versus the hunt for it. Because as a reminder, while this drop list is like 90%, the same as classic mode drops on Affinia, and mostly the same as classic PSO, there are going to be some differences. So I'd rather focus on the items so you understand why I'm putting them on the list, rather than some of the specific hunts. So I will just do a quick check to make sure that I'm not talking nonsense here. The red barrier should be a combinable from... Yeah, basically everything. So there's sky, blue, pink, red, orange, yellow, white should go to normal mode drop. That looks correct. Okay. So I'll do some cross checks here and there. I'll try to clean it up before it officially goes up on our Discord. So if chat wants to fact check me in real time, feel free to open up the availability of these items in the Affinia and we will update. Because there are a lot of items. I'm sure there's a couple I'm slightly off on just because I've been moving them around so much. So anyway, as a reminder, red, yellow, blue barrier corresponds to the spell color. You need an amplifier of a technique or of the color, and I talk about how to get these different amplifiers. They can also be dropped as box run stuff, so if you don't want to hunt enemies for them, it is possible to do more than one. If you're playing episode 2, for example, there are some good box rares from this. I don't really recommend Episode 2 in general to play unless you're doing the box hunt specifically. Normal mode Episode 2 is actually surprisingly terrible. I think originally in the notes I wrote something like literally like just don't even consider doing Episode 2. The only reason you would play Episode 2 is for the amplifier. I'm gonna be real with you, you're gonna do it as like first time to view the story, but otherwise there are I don't think any meta runs in Episode 2 that aren't involving the barriers and the amplifiers. They're, they're bad. They're really bad. Don't do not do episode 2. Um, so, <laughs> so outside of episode 2, let's scroll a little further down. There is an uber rare. Believe it or not, there's an uber rare in normal mode that I think is worth talking about called S-Parts version 2.0. Let's take a look at this item in the bottom right. So not a very high level requirement. Level requirement is 17. And you might notice the defense in it is not really great. It only offers a 30 and 1 resistance. 10% resistance is pretty bad. Honestly, like, you should be looking for 20 plus if you want, like, a solid barrier. Its real bonus, however, is this middle part. 15 accuracy. 
As we said before, 15 accuracy is the equivalency of almost 20 levels worth of accuracy. So if you happen to get this drop, which I will let you know, chat, in Ver in Ephinia right now, which I believe is also the same in the Classic server, Gilchex, the robots that love to punch you in Episode 1, in the mines. They have a 1 in 10,000 drop rate. So this item is not going to happen very often. I want to I want to let it sink in. This is not something that is going to happen normally. I'm going to put this in here for the people that are just really, really lucky and they just happen to be playing episode one and they're like, what is this item? That's for those people. You can farm this item. It is really good. It is tedious to farm. So you could go, you could try if you're playing, you know, story mode episode one. Consider maybe this ID. You never know, miracles could happen. And if you do, hey, you got a armor, or excuse me, you got a shield slash barrier that you're going to be using for the whole game. <laughs> so, congrats. So I just thought I'd put this here. Now chat, I want to draw attention to some particularly absolute trash drop rates, and we'll explain why I don't recommend these. I'm going to leave them out from the list going forward. So if you're wondering why you're like, oh, but you could get like MN60 Vice and normal. No, 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 no. There's a reason I don't mention a lot of these items. I'm trying to save you the headache. So we're going to go through the old adage of just because you can doesn't mean you should. They'll give a great example, chat. So I I'm even going to ask this question to Chris. I'll let Chris guess the number. What do you think the drop odds are? without looking it up, in episode one of getting a Fire Scepter Agni. Now I'm going to give you what you can get it in hard mode, which is something you should probably do. So for example, the Hildebear, which is somewhat uncommon, considered uh, usually I think high drop chance and low rare rate or something like that, I forget offhand, um, has a 1 in 45. So what do you think are the odds <laughs> in normal mode of getting it from a Bull Claw or a Guild Check on Pink ID? So take your time. I'll, I'll let you think about it. Ponder deeply in your soul, and then when I tell you the answer, you'll understand why I did not include this on the list. I'm fact-checking one thing before we go further. In normal, 1 in 2,000? Uh, that's actually too generous. That is actually too generous. If you had told me one, if for the guild chick, one in 14,629, you would have been correct. So anyway, chat, this is what I'm trying to avoid in the list. And I want to point out this example to you, because if you don't look at those drop rates and you can see that Pink ID can fi farm the Fire Scepter Agni in that list, you are wasting your time. Don't even bother. Like literal trash rare. You figured you went too low. It is like actual nonsense. So let's talk about, we'll talk about this item in more detail in hard mode, I guess, but we'll, we'll talk about why this is used. So it has a fairly high requirement for MST. So probably makes sense to also not pick it up on normal mode. It doesn't have really great stats, but it gives you 20% to all fire techniques. Similarly, we're gonna play another game since I want Chad to go through the same amusement that I did while talking about these. So we have, a, we have an enemy part item, which require you to go through a series of quests involving Dr. Osto's research or the unsealed door. Again, please reference online guides or other previous videos for how to unlock the weapon part upgrades. So again, we're, we're, gonna, play, we're gonna play another game. We're gonna see how close Chris can get. So the normal drop rate on hard mode is one in 128. The drop rate on the same enemy, the Grass Assassin, is 1 in 116. So very hard, 116. Hard mode, 128. What do you think it is on normal mode? <laughs> these these are the kinds of things where, like, I will try not to normally flood the chat with numbers, but I want you to understand that there are just... There is just absolute trash nonsense rares. 1 in 2100. I'm sorry, this time you overshot. If you had said 1 in 10,000, you would have been right. 10,082, more specifically. But you, you had the right idea. You, you had to go more than a factor of 10. So it just it's just truly nonsense. I just I really don't get it, chat. <laughs> I know. 
Be better luck next time. We'll, we'll try some more guesses to go forward with it. Um, so we'll talk about this item since we're here. So if you go through the Dr. Asso's research, uh, this, this introduces a new weapon type called Twin Sword, which is not a common drop. It's specific to rares. I don't think there's a single normal item that has this. So what I want to draw your attention to, it needs 390 ATP, which is fairly high, which again is why I think you can't normally get it on normal mode. So think about it this way, you know, if you were starting with around 80 ATP, you would need to somehow gain about 300 ATP between your mag and your levels, which if you're getting 7 a level, in like 40 levels, you're like most of the way there and the rest could be mag. So you could reasonably use this in very hard mode as a fresh character. Um, it's worth picking up when you can, of course. But I want to draw attention to this. So, Twin Swords. This is the only version of this weapon type where you hold two different sabers that forces can use. So not only is it a good hunter weapon, but if you want to just play a melee force, this is like one of your must-pick items. Um, one other benefit that the monster items get over the other items is that while the random percentages on the items are nice, you cannot guarantee the hit percentage. So, like, I could get, like, 60 native, 40 dark, but no hit percentage. And I will basically ignore the weapon because it doesn't have hit percentage. But, monster weapons are different. If you're playing episode 4, uh, again, consult our previous quest video. You can upgrade the weapon to get hit percentage. So you can make these, like, fairly easy to acquire. So you need to kill 100 Grass Assassins. That's like three, four quests. That's like nothing. That is like honestly nothing, like in terms of like grind time. And it is essentially like a potential endgame weapon for you as a force. And still really good for you as a hunter. So we're going to be talking about different types of carries going forward. We're going to call them Popper Carries. Arguably, this is best in slot for forces, since this is the only type of weapon they, they can use here. But I just want to draw attention to it. It's a very interesting weapon. Unfortunately, I didn't know how to unlock the monster parts when I first played the game, so I missed my window of opportunity when I played. So I highly recommend... I highly recommend that you do what you need to do for the Unsealed Door. Then I believe it's Claire's Deal 5, and then you after playing 9-5 uh, The Chosen, I think is the quest, in episode 4, to give you the hit percentage. But even without hit percentage, it's still a really, really solid weapon, honestly, for vanilla playthroughs. So please, please, please consider this weapon. Okay. So we're, we're going to have a category that I'm going to bring up. I'm going to try not to list every item that shows up in episode 4, but I am going to push it very hard... I'm letting you know, there's a hard bias, heavy bias here. I really, really promote you as a force playing episode 4. I actually don't recommend for new characters to start in episode 4, and I'll tell you exactly what items will enable it for hunters and rangers. It's not a great thing to immediately jump into. It's a really great thing to go back to once you get like one or two specific items. Then it makes it so much easier. And you're gonna go, oh... Now I understand why people play this episode. But anyway, if you're a force, um, you get the you get ad slots from the rare enemies and boxes. So if you want to do the equivalency of box runs, literally every box that you open has a chance for ad slot and a fairly common enemy that is I don't know why I wrote surface here. This is available in all areas of episode four. So everywhere you go is potentially an ad slot, which is crazy. And then on top of this. Every other rare enemy, whether on the surface or underground, gives you a photon crystal. We're going to be talking about this in detail at the very end of the video, so for people that are interested in this, definitely check the timestamps. Um, but essentially, the photon crystal is a way to add the hit percentage to the weapon that we just talked about, the GSS and Saber. And it allows you to get access to not necessarily best in slot, but so good it will carry you to level 200. Like, they're, like, you pick these up, you will use them until the end of the game. Like, they're potentially that good. Not necessarily the best possible choice, but so powerful that they are run-defining. So they're in the top tier. They're just not literally the number one, necessarily, for a character. 
So be aware of this. So if you're playing it, if you're playing with a new character, probably avoid episode four a little bit. There are some niche things you could do, like for example, uh, there's a very common run for photon drops and easy techniques that involve going to massive attack for a C slash A B slash or A, where the initial wave is all rappies. And even if you can't defeat them, because they are fairly tanky for new players, rappies have an innate mechanic that they run away when struck. So if you have a long-range attack that hits multiple times, let's say Gazand or a Rafoe or um, a Sniper that you could just double tap quickly on, you could just force them to drop their items since rappies always drop items when spooked and hit again. And you don't even actually need to defeat them. You don't have to worry about actually killing them. So people will actually do this to get higher level armor and techniques. Just so, that, just so you're aware, even as a fresh character, you could go do this. And it is pretty powerful because it's like the equivalency of stuff that you would find in uh, Mines, which is the third area of Episode 1, to potentially Ruins, depending on how far in you go. So just be aware of that. Episode 4 OP. You're going to be hearing me say that a lot. And the thing is, is if you're looking to have the pure Mind Mag we mentioned earlier in our Mag discussion, literally on normal mode, if you just kill the surface... Actually, I broke surface it here. No matter where you go in Episode 4, you fight Rappies, and you could get Rappy Speak. So if you want to have your pure Mind Mag, um, at least once you complete normal and technically you could go to hard, consider just going back to Episode 4. Um, we're also going to just give one more shout out to Episode 4. Its XP is like 1.5 to 1.75 times the other episodes, and it's not as hard. There are more mechanics in it that make it a bit more challenging for new players, but it's it's not as crazy hard as you think it would be, especially if especially if you play Episode 2, which I genuinely think is way harder than Episode 4. Um, it can lead to some misconceptions that there's stuff harder than Episode 2. There really isn't. Episode 4 is free for forces. And, finer, and finally, I just want to double check this one. I don't think this is in the right place. Yeah, let me move this. I think this should have been in very hard. One second. I was gonna say, I don't think there's any cosmetics prior to hard mode. We just scroll through our massive list. Okay, we have it down there. Okay. I probably just forgot to move it, so we'll ignore that. So cosmetics are a specific thing to Affinia. If you see a heart of item, those are not in the original game. Essentially, you could combine them with certain items in order to get a uh, different look and feel for certain weapons. Um, that's all it does. It's cosmetic. I listed it there for people that want to do hunts. But yeah, it's generally not super important. Yeah, episode 2 on, on the whole is probably the hardest episode. That's why I also don't recommend playing it in general, let alone on normal mode. Anyway, there, there's my bias slipping in. So that's that's about it in terms of episode or of normal mode. Do not sleep on photon crystals. They are really, really, really powerful. Please remember that this is where you get them. We'll be reminding you throughout every difficulty. But trust me, they are super, 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 super unfair. Anyway, let's see what else you can get in, in hard mode. So let's say you're you're entering uh, level 20 territory. So let's take a look at the thing called the deep heart armor. So this is not a very hard run to do. It just is probably going to be done towards the tail end of hard mode, since these require fighting uh, bow claws, which are found in ruins. So there's a... Oh, actually, I'm going to make a note here. So, Red ID has a... Red ID is two times more likely to find. I'm gonna make a little note there for people that were curious. So normally it's a 1 in 320 or a 1 in 160 for some reason on Red ID. See that chat? This is why we double check the notes as we go through the notes. Um, so if you're green sky or red or yellow, you can get an item that essentially is, I can get ATP or attack points. So again, this is the equivalency of getting upwards of seven, maybe 10 levels, depending on the character, uh, worth of ATP. So pretty, pretty solid. 
Uh, this is basically considered the best in slot for casts in particular. So for example, uh, Rocket Seal has lower ATP than most other rangers. And Roncast is also really strong, but you know, more ATP is always more ATP. It's not a particularly hard thing to do. We talked about in our quest guide where to farm this item for easy uh, claw access. But uh, yeah, definitely something to consider, especially with the idea that you could get the add slots, which we mentioned before in episode 4, to, as you would think, add slots to an armor. Save those add slots for actually good armor, please. Please don't use them on random armor. Unless it's level 1 frame and you're going to make a lot of new characters, save those add slots. Just, just a PSA for that. So again, we don't really care about the stats on it that much. We just care about this 35 ATP, because damage is everything in this game. Next, we're going to talk about what I would consider another best in slot for ATP users or people that worry or that are concerned about attack power. It needs 120 accuracy, which is somewhat demanding. I don't think you can quite get this on normal consistently, especially depending on the character. Um, the big draw for it, although its damage range is low, it has the Berserk special. So if you have a really powerful mag, if you've been taking uh, 1k gambles for those god powers, if you've been collecting a lot of power material, this is pretty much your go-to weapon to delete everything in the game. So the risk is every time you fire, you, you lose a lot of health. But the flip side is that you can absolutely obliterate everything. So high like, I'm going to say high risk, I'm going to say medium risk, because at least you can use it at a distance. Medium risk for very high reward, but it requires you to have some good mag stats. So, it's still slightly above in power since you can grind at 9 points than most mech guns. In fact, let's let's compare it to a normal mech gun, so chat has an idea. So this is your basic mech gun. It's a grind at 9, but only has a max damage of 4. Whereas this one has potentially up to 25. Not like a huge difference. You won't be getting mech guns for their base damage, essentially. So these are probably the most stat-dependent items. So these are things that I'd like to consider more of like a mid to late game bloomer. But they're not bad to just hold on to either. So also, what you can end up doing... Oh, by the way, Chad. We get- oh, 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 I spoiled it. Uh, my bad, I didn't mean to scroll down far enough. I was gonna say, guess- guess what the drop rate was on the Gil chick that I didn't bother talking about in normal mode. But it was 1 in 16,000, by the way. Versus the 1 in... What was it? 200? We'll just back up slightly. Yeah, like the 1 in 45 Hilda Bear versus 16,000. Normal mode is such such a joke, chat. I don't know why it's like that. Of course it is. <clears throat> so, Disco Brave Man. Really high ATP requirement. Again, this is stuff you might not be able to use right away, but you want to pick it up for later because they are absolute game changers. Um, as you can see, slightly more than the 25 damage uh, for the slicer there. Scroll it so you can see it here. Every class can use it. Okay accuracy. Has Berserk. Again, another like best in slot kind of thing. Slicer can hit up to four targets by default, so nothing different about that. However, if you get this thing with hit percentage, and as I mentioned before, there's an armor called 13. Um, basically, this will give you guaranteed attack accuracy. Unfortunately, this is only an ultimate. But it's going to make you aware that there are some items that are effective with the best in slots. So I'm just going to draw attention to that very briefly, but we will not cover it in the guide itself. Um, but essentially, this is just massive damage on Berserk and somewhat easy farm. There are so many places you can farm in. In fact, I'm going to scroll just so you can see all the different rare drop rates. Not necessarily where you could farm it, but you can see like there are a lot of different ways you could farm it. So I just included a few here for your reference. There's not many in hard mode. It's more prevalent in uh, very hard in ultimate. But it is possible if you're playing episode 4 hard mode. Like let's say you're on very hard and you need to level faster. You go actually go back to hard mode episode 4. Because remember, XP in episode 4 equals broken. You have a slightly easier farm doing hard mode episode 4 than very hard mode episode 1, and definitely in comparison to episode 2 in very hard mode. So, if you're in that situation where you are not necessarily first time in, or if you're a broken force, because forces don't really care about episode 4 that much, other than uh, having a bit of HP, uh, this could be something you pick up on your way. Now let's talk about survivability. Let's talk about an item called Secret Gear. 
This is probably one of my favorite items in the game. So believe it or not, this little innocuous level 41 to use, so sadly, you can get it in hard mode, but you can't use it in hard mode unless you overlevel. Uh, gives you 30 to most resistances, so pretty good. Only 20 nice though, which is okay. More importantly, it gives up to 85 defense. So for those not aware of what this number range means, technically when an item drops, it can roll between 75 and 85 defense if it's not acquired from a quest or from the gambles. And this is really, really powerful. So let, let me put some numbers in context for new players. Let me take the most powerful barrier available in ultimate. So while it has better ice resistance and has a level 63 to use, it is half of the defense of the other shield. So this thing is probably best in slot for a while unless you have access to three seals. There's really no reason not to get this on a majority of your characters. Um, unless you're a ranger. And we'll talk we'll we'll talk about ranger wall later. Don't worry, chat. We're we're gonna get to some of the quest items, of course. But this is probably the best casual pickup you can get. It's in a run where Oh. Why does Red Eye D get the bonus again? So anyway, Chan, apparently red ID is called the privileged ID. So everything else gets, you can't see it on screen, but everything else has a 1 in 457, which is, it's like, th that's what we call a decent grind. You're not going to get it within like four quests, but probably within like 10 or 15 quests, you'll probably acquire it. So it requires a bit more commitment, except for hard mode, red uh, ID only has 229. So they're twice as likely to get it. So you'll probably get it in under 10 quests on Red ID? That's kind of silly. Anyway, I don't necessarily think you should dictate your uh, character based off of hard mode drops. In fact, a big thing that we're going to talk about in a future video will be picking the right ID after we go through all of the items, of course. Uh, but just something to consider. I guess if it's between all those IDs, Red ID gets a bonus for some reason. So anyway, really solid resistances, kind of hard to top. And again, stuff that you can only find in Ultimate is only slightly better in Ice Resistance and worse in everything other than Evade. So pretty good. So your options are Episode 1, Farm Secret Gear by going through Mines, which if you're playing through GameCube, you have to go through Mines to go to the end of Episode 1 anyway to go to Hard Mode. So that's just kind of like a on-your-way rare. Then there's something if you happen to venture into Episode 2. So let's... Well, let's, let's just open both of these real quick. We're going to leave Secret Gear open, and then we're going to go back to Attribute Wall. We're going to compare the two. So it has slightly worse evasion. However, it has much better resistances. So generally, I will always consider this to be better Secret Gear. You can... You can live with either, both of them are about the same. Do whichever one makes sense for you for the hunt purpose. So all classes can use this, they have the same kinds of requirements. Not really too much different here. So just be aware of this chat, let me scroll it slightly for the chat. So if you want a more solid endgame barrier, technically attribute wall is better. Because uh, dark and light resistance is more important for the end of the game. And having more ice resistance and light resistance is actually somewhat relevant for episode 1 final boss in particular. Sadly, you get this in episode 2. So think about it. I'm now checking to see if Red ID gets privileged. Oh no, Red ID doesn't get the bonus here. That's weird. Very strange to me, champ. So I think playing as any of these IDs is okay. I'd probably recommend if I had to pick one, probably Sky ID. Uh, which is why I listed it separately in first compared to the other ones. Because Spaceship is easier to do, and even though there's not many pan arms, which is Hid Doom is part of the pan arm enemy because it splits into two, uh, it's still it's still probably fine. So if you're really looking for defense, just pick one. And speaking of pick one, we get to play our favorite game of Let's Compare the Rares. So, you need a damaging pistol for bosses. Let's open up our two options. We have Arista, and we're gonna have Suppressed Gun. 
We're gonna take a look at both of these. So, so they both have the same requirement. Let me scroll slowly for them for chat. So both of them have the same ATA requirement. Roll slightly further down. So if we compare the two of these, we can see suppressed gun has more ATP and more base accuracy. Uh, the other weapon grinds up to potentially 235 total damage, which is still worse than suppressed gun. However, not everybody wants to play through episode 2. In particular, if you are playing on GameCube and you have to play through all parts of episode 2 in order to reach it. I would say if you have the choice to quickly farm it, getting a suppressed gun in Spaceship is not a very hard run to do. And you could get that with Viridian Green or Purple. I don't think it really matters who you bring here. Yeah, I don't think the ID matters either. ID doesn't seem to matter. Okay. So, this is just strictly better. You're probably going to be using this unless you use Photon Crystals for literally all the way into Ultimate, if you pick this up. Because again, this is your long-range boss damage as a hunter. It's just solid damage in general. 110 accuracy is not as hard to hit as you think it would be. 120 is a bit more demanding, but 110 is really not that bad. In particular, if you get like just like two god arms, I think would qualify you by level 40, for example, for most characters. Um, but the raw base damage of this gun also means that forces have an option to actually damage enemies if they run out of technique points. So kind of important to keep in mind for damage purposes. So I will recommend Suppressed Gun if you can do the Episode 2 hunt, which is not terribly hard. It, it's just, it's Spaceship is not the worst difficulty ever. It's just not the most fun thing ever to level. Otherwise, there are a million farms. Again, I, I even in my notes I wrote, I tried to limit to one run per ID. Basically, while you happen to be doing, for example, if you're doing secret gear runs on the IDs that can get secret gear, you might just pick up a Varista at the same time, which is nice. So, I don't think the damage between them is so big that it invalidates the Varista. So if you happen to be going for Seeker gear on one of those, uh, those IDs, it's probably better if you just pick up the Varista to just continue playing than it is to farm a suppressed gun, is what I'll leave it at. Or if you're playing with other people and just don't feel like doing Episode 2, which I don't blame you, I don't really like Episode 2 either. Um, then at that point you could decide if you just want to pick up one of these guns. And again, a lot of IDs get them. You can see there's multiple farms, like Yellow has it in at least three enemies in one given area. So it's kind of insane, really, uh, how many ways you could get this, which is kind of nice. And what's also nice is if you're looking to pick up the Grass Assassin arms, which we mentioned before, um, Grass Assassins drop them on normal, hard, and very hard, and all IDs can get them on normal, hard, and very hard, so that, that doesn't change at all. So if you happen to be doing a hunt for Grass Assassin arm for the future, you might also just happen to pick up a Varista at the same time. So this is probably one of the more easily acquired common guns, and probably one of the only common drops I will mention that is not considered a best-in-slot, and it goes into a category I like to call the Pauper Carry, where this will probably take you to Ultimate and pretty much take you towards the end of Ultimate, but you might need a little bit of assistance to kind of finish things off in a consistent manner. So I think this is probably good enough, and it will carry you as long as you need to go. So you mentioned Grass Assassin Arms, I'm not going to go further with it. Um, I will mention there's some alternatives to Grass Assassin Arms if you think the requirement is too high to use. Let's go ahead and open up some options here. We have two items. We have the... Oh, I didn't find Twin Saber. One second. That feeling when it doesn't know where it is. Okay, let me, let me go from here. Sorry about that chat. Maybe it's Twin Brand I'm thinking of. I think this should be twin brand my bad here we go this is why we got to correct the notes in real time so there's two options for what i consider like a dual weapon so for hue casts and male characters in general there's the stag cutlery so instead of having two separate swords it's a double-sided weapon if you want to do your best darth maul impression stag cutlery is the thing for you 
it's it's not bad in terms of ATP. It won't necessarily be higher than other weapons. Where the benefit of this is, and this is where it's not always clear when you're comparing weapon types, is that for things like a saber or a partisan, one swing is one hit. For stag cutlery and other things of the double saber, that's not true. So your first hit will be two. It's usually two, one, two. So you'll end up doing like a ton of damage with it, which is kind of nice. At least I think the... Actually, I forget now if the last hit is two hits. I know the first hit is always two. Because it is very, very nice for the other characters. But anyway, you get more hits than you are supposed to get compared to the other weapons. So you'll be applying more damage more quickly. So if you have high ATP from a character, like you're playing like a Hugh cast, sometimes just hitting multiple times is all that really matters. Now, if you're playing a character that is not a male, your alternative would be Twin Brand. However, I will note that both of these are Episode 4 only runs, so these are things that you would probably go back to. You would probably not do these as those characters in hard mode at the time you could do them, but when you're done with hard mode and can access very hard mode, again, reminder, then I would recommend going back to Episode 4. So let's talk about some other potential best in slots. These are the things that are actually worth grinding for, regardless of difficulty. Like, they are so good if they drop with hit percentage, that people will absolutely spend hours and hours and hours grinding to get a hit percentage of these. And so we have another Twin Sword. So with Grass Assassin Arm is the very easy pickup, the one that is the consistent carry, and that's why I put that in the Pauper carry. The true best in slot for Hunters, in particular the Hugh cast, is the Musashi. And you're like, okay, but, you know, I'm looking at this, the ATP is okay, so... Why do people choose this as their best in slot for the end of the game? Surely they're stronger weapons. And technically you're right, but it has Berserk. And there's an item that is called the Proof of Sword Saint, which improves the accuracy in ultimate mode to give an additional... Let's fact check this. 30 accuracy to the weapon. So if you have two Proof of Sword Saints, it's the equivalency of having 60 extra accuracy we're on the first swing, 60%, which scales with however many hits you are in the combo. So this is one of those few weapons you could berserk, 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 and everything dies. It is insanely good, even without the ultimate level item, Proof of Sword Saint. Um, and it's on a drop that's fairly easy to farm across all difficulties, so no matter who you are, you simply defeat Dragon, aka the easiest boss of the game on hard mode. And there's a lot of different quests you could do, like TTF against the Quest uh, video, uh, that will let you reach the dragon more quickly than just going through standard play. So yeah, this is something that's potentially worth farming. At minimum, just pick it up without hit percentage. And consider if you're struggling at all in ultimate mode, coming back to here and getting a Musashi, because it is fantastic. Now we're going to talk about our first recommended partisan of the day you might notice another hunter only HTP is not it's high don't get me wrong it's high but it's not like 600 it's not 800 it's not 900 and so you might notice that this one says C page so this is an this is an actual pay to win weapon you might see I'll highlight it here you can see it in the little mini cutout if you're willing to pay 10,000 Meseta per swing, which is insane, this is not something you would normally do in normal and hard mode, but maybe in very hard you would, and definitely in ultimate you would. It does 5.56 times the base damage of the weapon. And it can crit. It is absolutely crazy. Absolutely crazy. So this is an if you get this with any amount of hit percentage, it is run endingly powerful. So highly, highly recommend this. This is more of a late game rare. It is also a solid ATP bonus. So honestly, even without the special, this will still be better than common drops. So I'm still gonna leave this here, regardless. So generally speaking, if you wanted to have the meta on it, blue ID gets it basically everywhere on almost every ID. Um, other IDs can occasionally get it in other places very situationally versus, like, rare enemies. This, this is... All, I think. Uh... 
Yeah, so I'll just know where some of these are. I'll try to clean up if I see any of the places missing as we go through. Um, but essentially, there's a lot of places you could farm it on Blue ID. You can farm it here if you want to. It, I mean, it's pretty good. You have four different enemies that grant it to you, and the drop rate is not terrible. Just double checking that this is accurate. The one thing I have to be careful about, as I said before, is that there are big charts. Where did I say this was available? Evil Shark, Nano Dragon, Mickey, and Pidium. I think that's for very hard mode. Yeah, that's for very hard mode. Let me clean it up slightly. <laughs> Don't worry, it'll be in very hard mode in a little bit. Okay. Yeah, I think I just accidentally copied it from the very hard mode. So let, let's correct it in real time. What should you farm potentially on hard mode for that? So from an episode one perspective, looking at the drop rates... Hmm. Probably caves. I'm gonna say caves. Let's clean this up. So it's still caves that I would recommend, but it would be... The name of the rare lily, which I believe is Nar Lily, which I'm going to denote as the rare by putting the parentheses there, and the uh, the pole the pole lily slime, which I did not remember its name at all until I did this. So there's two rare enemy chances that you could get it here. It's slightly better than doing a Viridian run in episode one. Again, there are a lot of places to farm it. I would probably recommend you wait for episode. Or, or do very hard mode instead, since there's more overall drops. However, you can pick it up early. Every area basically has one for you to get, so... Actually, I'm going to say all areas. I'm going to say most areas. It, it almost doesn't matter. You're not really going to farm it here, necessarily. But you could just pick it up arbitrarily while playing Blue ID. So if you're not sure what to get after going through all the items, that's a pretty safe one. So let's talk about uh, the next big thing for Hunters. So we have three different swords. We have the Last Survivor. We have the Flowin' Sword, which there's like a million of them, but trust me, I just mean the regular one. We have something called the Dragon Slayer. So all these are relatively close in power. I don't think it really matters which one you pick, as long as you pick one. So we'll start with, uh... I guess we'll start with Last Survivor. I would probably recommend this over the other choices if given a chance. So let's move this a little lower. Move it a little more for comparison purposes. You can see these are all Hunter only, nothing really changes here. So, Dragon Slayer has the most rolled ATP. Flowin' Sword has lower ATP, however, it is a set effect item. If you happen to pick up Flowin's Frame and Flowin's Shield, technically Flowin' Sword then becomes better. So, in some situations, this will be better than the other choices. And then, Last Survivor is kind of an in between. It's a lot easier to farm, especially if you're playing not on the Affinia server, uh, on other episodes, compared to. Dragon Slayer, which is generally a harder farm. So, recommended if you happen to be playing Sky ID and playing like Episode 1, or you're playing Temple 2, which has four different drops, by the way, if you really want it. I and mean, this is probably my recommended one. Pretty insane. Or alternatively, if you're trying to get uh, multiple rares, Spaceship is also a good one to do on Sky ID, because I believe that's also the attribute wall, correct? Yes. You could combine your attribute wall run in order to get Last Survivor and basically be set for the game. So I think I would generally recommend Last Survivor, not from a stat perspective, but, but just because there are other runs you should probably be doing on those IDs. Now, sadly, you might notice that it's basically only Sky ID that gets these things, so... Uh, Sky ID privilege. Sadly, there's not re really much you could do here. Technically, you can also farm this with Morphos on Yellow ID. 
but that hunt is just not worth it. If you're fighting Morphos in Episode 2 on hard mode, um, I I'm going to ask you, are you feeling okay? And then I'm going to just say, just don't. <laughs> in, in that order, just don't. Don't do that. Don't farm Morphos for items. So don't expect me to recommend a lot from Seabed unless it's like... I don't know. Unless it's like Del Beater for something really crazy. It has to be really good to justify that farm, which is why I'm not going to recommend it for new players. Just be aware, as I said before, we're not going to include every single run, every single ID, but we're going to give the ones where you will be playing normally to advance, and this is the things you can find, not like... Like, you need to defeat Maricus to get it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> exactly. I'm like, these are the things, like, they, they exist, but even if you were playing another character, just make a Sky ID. If you just really want the item that badly, just play Sky ID. I know, it's gross. Well, anyway, um, if not, uh, a backup is Orange and Yellow. They just have to fight Hilda Bear. So this is a pretty easy farm for Orange and Yellow. I would recommend that over Yellow ID Morphos. <laughs> Do you know what I mean, chat? One of those farms is slightly harder than the other. Just a little bit. So, yeah. Yeah, I love how I'm like, note, episode two drop rates are bad. Oh yeah, so that reminds me. So, the Hilda Bear. Go to Flow and Sword real quick. The Hilda Bear has a 1 in 45, which is pretty solid. The Morphos, arguably a much tougher enemy in a really awful area of the game, is a 1 in 160. So, there's just a lot of things where I really question the design choices of Sega, but you know. It is, it is what it is there, Chad. It is what it is. So anyway, so I just check my Survivor. You'll probably pick it up either as part of an attribute wall run or just casually playing Episode 1. Flow and Sword's not a bad backup if you're orange or yellow. Sky gets it literally basically everywhere in episode one. So that's a really, really good backup one. So you could be farming, for example, uh, looking for Rare Rappy for Last Survivor. And if you're casually playing, killing Hil Hilda Bears and Gigabumos, or Gubumos, excuse me, in the same area will net you one of the two swords. So again, you have a lot of options for hunts. I'm not going to say one is necessarily the best. I will just kind of draw your attention to like where items have like an overlap where I notice them. I don't farm a lot of early difficulty stuff, so I'm not going to definitely call myself an expert with that. But where applicable, I will try to draw that out. Um, otherwise, if you're just being carried through episode four, like if somebody's power leveling you or you're a force, you're playing Viridian, Zoos drop Dragon Slayer. Zoos are not hard for a force to kill. Rangers are kind of annoying. Hunters are kind of annoying. Just be aware of that. Believe it or not, chat, we're now done with Hunters. So we're going to play pick, pick a weapon. So my suggestion is you need a shotgun to carry you through early parts of Ultimate. And that is the classic definition of a pauper carry. The one that's probably the most common is the Crush Bullet. It is the weakest of the choices. Followed up by that is the Meteor Smash, which, if you're the right ID for it, definitely go for it. And if you're being carried or you're doing Episode 4, Final Impact is just an even stronger version of all of the above. It even has a better grind, it has more accuracy, it has no evade penalty, and it gives you luck. It's basically everything you kind of want in a shotgun that is not a charge arm or a berserk arm to delete enemies. This is a pretty good backup until you can find one of those. So, chat, we're gonna we're gonna play a little game. We're gonna play a little game, chat. <laughs> this weapon is technically available in normal mode on a bull claw. What do you think the drop rate is? So the most common one, the easier one that you could do literally is you're entering hard mode. Is you fight a Hilda Bear which is probably going to happen if you're playing on, on normal mode, or not normal, playing on hard mode. And that is a 1 in 45. <laughs> so take a wild guess, chat. The bull claw on, on Viridian. <laughs> what do you think the drop rate is? 1 in 7,000? I'm sorry. The answer is 1 in 23,406. I just like making fun of normal mode, chat. I'm like, listen, if I'm going to stare at the items, I'm going to let you know there is just absolute nonsense. 
Um, you're not gonna guess this one, but the Sinnoh Barrel of the same difficulty on the same ID in an easier area than Ruins is 1 in 1,862, which is insane, but not as insane as the Bull Claw. I, I don't understand, chat. It just honestly, my, my brain hurts looking at some of these drop rates. Like, honestly, what is this nonsense? So anyway, you're very likely to pick up a Hilda Bear or a Gigabumo drop as Crush Bullet, so that's why I'd recommend it. If you're farming for Meteor Smash, you might end up with Crush Bullet, which is why I think Viridian Forest Runs are pretty good. Otherwise, if you're playing through caves, naturally advancing through the game, then you might pick up a Meteor Smash, and I will state it is just better. You will not use the specials on any of these weapons, just for clarity. You only care about its accuracy and damage. So. Meteor Smash being another 30 ATP is pretty good. If you happen to get a Crush Bullet with like 50% towards Dark or like Native, maybe you'll use it. Since as a reminder that weapon percentage multiplies the weapon damage, not your damage. So that's why Mech Guns with their terrible like 15 to 25 are not as impacted as let's say a Saber. So pick one of those. Otherwise, only if you're being carried, or you're coming back to hard mode, you can fight the Goron Detonator. Uh, the Goron Detonator is one of the harder enemies in the game, so this is not something you do without prior knowledge of the game. Do not recommend, but when you're being carried, because Episode 4 is a very common carry quest area in, uh, for PSO, if it's played on Viridian, you just might pick this up. Just be aware of that. Uh, finally, we have two weapons that I think enable the Ranger specifically to do Episode 4. Hunters, I feel like if you have a nice Double Saber and the Varista, I think they're good enough. You're going to have some trouble with an enemy called the Zoo, which is a bit unfortunate, since you don't really have an easy way to get rid of them unless you have Gafoe, uh before going to Ultimate Mode. However, rangers have a cheat option to deal with that enemy, and those are the launchers. So let's compare the two launchers. So chat has a baseline, so we have Guilty, Guilty Light with 250 ATP, we'll be grinding for 18 more. Uh, Photon Launcher is about 30 ATP less, grinds for a bit less. Um, I think it actually has a slightly more useful special. Hold is not terrible. Blizzard is sadly mostly useless. You could use this as a joke, I guess. It's it's probably not going to trigger super often. As I said, at most it could trigger 40% of the time. I guess with the fact that, uh, for those not aware, launchers pierce up to four targets. It does less damage for every target it passes through. With one exception being the ES launcher, which ignores that rule. Let me see, maybe it'll mention here on the side. doesn't mention there on the side, that's fine. It's like, I think it goes down to like 15% or something. It's probably on the general weapon tab, but that's fine. It's not super important to know that. What is important to know from this is that these two weapons are different than snipers in the fact that not only do they pierce targets and fire in a straight line, but they infinitely hit upwards and downwards. And you're like, okay, well, why would that matter? Well, there are some enemies like the worm boss when it leaps overhead, uh, the worm boss when it moves in general, the dragon boss when it takes flight, and any flying creature like the zoo where there's a mechanic in the game where if they're moving you will just automatically miss like almost every time unless you have a perfect shot so to ignore that mechanic where they are physically moving and that causes you to whiff which is really annoying because it's not even tied into their evade so your accuracy will not matter for that by the way uh, people will carry launchers to hit those enemies, so it doesn't matter if the zoo is dive bombing you from above you or slightly in front of you, or there's targets between you and the zoo, aka the giant bird, which is a very common thing in episode 4. This is a automatic shutdown of that enemy, and it's pretty strong to use in general combat too. In fact, I ended up using this more than snipers, uh, just because it had high weapon ATP. And if you happen to get one with a decent percentage, it scales way better than shotguns do. Um, and it can hit four targets. So if there's only two or three enemies in the room, or they're really spread apart, and they're mostly really far away from you versus, like, horizontally spread in a wide area, which is what the shotgun's good at, then the launcher ends up being kind of, like, your best choice as a pauper carry. So with that in mind, 
Guilty Light is the better version of Photon Launcher. Guilty Light can only really be farmed in Episode 4, so it kind of is somewhat counterintuitive to get. However, the enemy you get it from is an Astark, and normally you fight Astarks before you fight Zoos. So in theory, you could get it to defeat the Zoos if you need to, if you're playing first time in. Um, otherwise, probably get assistance with getting the item. Otherwise, this one's a pretty common one, no matter what ID you play. Fight the Mines boss in Episode 1, get Photon Launcher. So you might go to you might do the mines first in order to get guilty light. See what happens. Both are not really you don't really need to get guilty light. It's just a small upgrade if you're looking to be more efficient. Maybe that's what you do. But again, the focus here is for XP to leave the difficulty, not necessarily the 20 ATP from the weapon. So the chat, we're finally done with the hard mode carry items, except for when it comes to forces. So we looked at Fire Scepter Agni. We're going to look at it again. We're just going to keep it very brief, though. We're going to look at the Ice Staff, and we're going to look at Storm 1 Indra. So these are referred to commonly as the Elemental Wands. So essentially, all of them have fairly high MST requirements. Some of them give different values of MST. Only forces can use these. Do not worry about getting them with other characters. I don't know why they thought the lightning one would end up being the best one, because they, they clearly wanted... The farms you have to do for the lightning one are much harder, and the requirements to use them are higher. The technically lightning gives the best overall MST, so if you're looking for something to learn techniques early, you could put this on, because when you go to use a technique disc, which is dropped randomly, which I didn't mention as honorable mentions, I probably should have, um... This will just enable you to use it several levels early. Yeah, we're going to skip the vocals. So technically, if you want to hold on to something to get techniques faster, Storm 1 is the best. It just gives a 20% bonus to all lightning. Ice Staff is 20% to all ice. Fire Staff is 20% to all fire. Fire is probably the most common followed by Ice Staff. Honestly, not a lot of people use Storm 1, sadly. It's just not super meta. Um, it's slightly more useful prior to ultimate because the robots and mines, for example, are all weak to lightning. So Razond and Gazond are very powerful there, but they flip a lot of resistances in ultimate mode. So sadly, what's really good in there is not as good in... Excuse me, what's good prior to pre-ultimate is not as good as what's good in ultimate, sadly. So just be aware of that. YouTube, please. You're killing me. I'm gonna be like, I, I have to be able to skip around in the video slightly. So these are the best in slots for a majority of the game. They're not necessarily the number one, but you will use them basically all the way to 200. There's nothing wrong with them. They're really good. So make sure to pick up all of these at some point through your runs. Um, we'll call these pauper carries since they're somewhat more niche or specific to certain bosses. You don't necessarily need them if you have the elemental scepters, but they are wands, I mean, but they help. So we have the Club of Laconium, which grants a 40% bonus to uh, Foey. If you're playing a Foe New World, this is actually extremely powerful. Lower, lower requirement to use. Doesn't give any MST for some reason. Again, rare, rare canes and wands don't really make any sense in this game, to be honest with you. Uh, I will denote one thing I don't think I mentioned earlier. So, females want to hold canes and wands whenever possible over rods for fast cast. Males just unequip everything. So, Fomars will generally not use this unless they need to hit a damage threshold or save TP. Just so the chat is aware. I'd say Club of Zumerian is more... Probably the most niche choice here. I thought about including this only under niche, but there are technically bosses that are weak to lightning that it is useful if you're playing solo to use. Uh, I would say one of the strongest of the elemental ones that do 40% to a basic te technique is the Mace of Adamant. So what this will end up doing is... There are a lot of enemies that have ice weakness in single player that don't have it in multiplayer. I'll give a great example, the Chaos Bringer slash Dark Bringer and uh, Episode 1 Ruins has a really, really big ice weakness in single player, but is near immune in multiplayer. This, in later 
areas let you basically three shot them and normally they're like a mini boss for the area so being able to three spell something that has like five to six times the health of some of the surrounding enemies is kind of bonkers so uh people will bring in this specific club of laconium uh for one particular thing and that is making sure that you do enough damage to f to falls so there's a pretty infamous cycle within the final boss of episode one where the boss is immune on difficulties outside of normal for long stretches of time. This buffs the only technique <clears throat> the boss really takes major damage from that you could spam. So this really just helps with boss clear. The people will bring that for boss clear. Let's move on to another item. If you're wondering what ID to play, my answer to you will always be pink ID. <clears throat> Pink ID gets basically every force item in the game. So if you're not sure how to get these items, when in doubt, pink ID. <laughs> Excuse me, chat. Now we have a support item. Technically, I could put this under niche, but I decided to keep this under force. So this item by itself is not really that great. I mean, it's a high MST item that has high ATP. So, like, weirdly, this does as much damage as the Photon Launcher we saw earlier. However, its true purpose is that you can upgrade it into uh, a Striker of Chow. So you could do it one of two ways. You could get a Chow Mag to do it. But the one that's more meta is that... You will instead play the quest towards the future in order to convert it, so you don't really need an item for it, but just be aware in case you have limitations for quests. So why is this good? Well, 695 MST, pretty steep requirement. It grants 55 MST, so it helps with finishing off uh, learning techniques of the game. Although honestly, you only really realistically need about 800 or 900 total to learn everything in the game. Uh, 35 defense isn't bad. The real bonus is that this one ends up getting 100% uh, range to shift to D-band. So that's it. It's just a support item. You don't use it for damage. You could use it for the base MST it grants. But unfortunately, since it's a rod type item, you won't see a lot of people using it for spells because it just makes you cast slower. I think it's really unfortunate because there were some interesting weapons. I think they were intending rods to be like massive items so they basically slow you down, but ultimately it just makes most rods in the game really terrible. So I don't recommend holding this if you're looking to do spellcasting damage. And then finally, another item I thought about putting under niche, but honestly it's not really niche for Fomarl, is this ridiculous item. So you might notice, chat, it's a shotgun but it only hits one target. So it's a very slow weapon. It has a damage range of 230 to 410. So if you've been paying attention to any of the damage numbers we talked about so far, this is twice as strong as Photon Launcher, and it is nearly three times stronger than Crush Bullet. So you're like, okay, it it's very slow, so that will counteract some of the damage bonus of this. So why would you potentially take this item? Well, Chad, if you might remember, we talked about special interactions earlier. The Fomarl shoots this as fast as a pistol. So instead of getting the Varista, she's doing double damage to the Varista. She has the range essentially of a sniper, as this has extended range over shotguns, and is 41 accuracy, and it is Devils. It is a completely unfair item for Fomarl. This is easily one of her best in slots until your late game ultimate. This item is stupid on Fomarl. If you're playing Fomarl, please use this item. It's hilariously funny. In fact, what I recommend at this point, if you're playing Fomarl and you get this item, go get a power mag, go get some god arms, go get like a Diska. <laughs> just, just go to town. You'll probably be more effective than most rangers at this point. Which is really sad, unless they got some like crazy charge arm or like berserk mech gun or something crazy. The raw ATP of this is insane. It's like actually insane. 400 attack power. Keep in mind we've we've talked about Musashi, a double sword, 
it still has less attack power than this gun. So this gun also scales hilariously well with, with enemy percentage. It does so much damage. Its grind could use a little bit of work, but honestly, it's, it's very niche on the other characters. I will point out though, I think this is technically the only option in the game. Chat can correct me if I'm wrong. In fact, I want to learn if I'm wrong. This might be the only sniper range weapon a Hugh cast can equip outside of the LNK Gatling gun. I want I want chat or people in YouTube to write some comments below. Does a Hugh cast have any other long range option? I feel like the answer is no. I've tried really hard to find them, but there's ones that have like sniper type as their type, but they only hit point blank, like the drill launcher. I thought it was actually firing drills, which would have been cool, but it's just some kind of like drill hand thing. So anyway, I think that is true. But anyway, this also gives hunters a very long range option if you're really desperate for a weapon. But I think due to, due to its attack speed, you generally will not use it on the hunters. Yeah, I'm really struggling to think of Hugh Cast. There's there's a lot of sniper range options for rangers. That's like not a problem. And then like Humar has like your Holy Ray, has this Hugh Neural, and Hugh Casile has uh, Rambling May, for example. So there's like a lot of female specific items that are snipers. But Hugh Cast is a very difficult person to get with some range. So I think this might be your only sniper esque range weapon as Hugh Cast. Uh, we'll we'll put that uh, to be fact checked. <laughs> but I, I would love to know what chat does for sniper range for Hugh Cast, because uh, that's a brutal life for some of the things. This is post-commentary Zicky here, so I just want to add a little thing here. I think I slightly misspoke before. I knew of the gun LNK-38 Combat, which is a longer range weapon using the shotgun animation that Hugh Cast can wield. However, when I'm looking and scrolling a little further down, I noticed it has the full range of a traditional sniper, which is 170 units. So I wanted to draw attention to that as one of the super late game, potentially, you cast items, but unfortunately you cannot get this prior to ultimate. I will give one more special shout out to Rainbow Baton. It technically has more range than most of the Hugh cast options. So again, if you're really desperate to hit a certain distance, uh, there's not many options the Hugh Cast unfortunately can get, and even fewer that are meta. So just be mindful of that when you're making a Hugh Cast. You're going to be relying more on either ending your combo strings with power attack to push enemies away, or more often, just not even completing your combo and retreating backwards, depending on the speed of the enemy. So good luck to the Hugh Cast out there. So there we go, chat. We're, we've almost made it out of hard mode. I promise you, we are almost done. At least with hard mode. We're a little past halfway in the notes. I have a feeling this video will be ultra long, but that's fine. We want this to be super, super, super comprehensive. We want no questions about going from the lower difficulties to this point. I'm gonna say the game is not being cooperative with me. So we're gonna talk about what we're gonna call niche weapons. So this one is, this one's kind of a weird choice, and I, I want to bring this into why I put this under potentially recommended. So you might notice, the ATP requirement is ridiculous. So even though you can get this in hard mode, arguably you might not even be able to use this by very hard. Depends on your character. So you're like, okay, so why did you, why did you recommend this item since it's so hard to use? So, remember chat I talked about before that male forces passed faster with unarmed. Fun fact, fist weapons, as, as it would make sense, use the unarmed cast speed. So if you just want a melee weapon on your faux mar or your faux Newman, and you want to be able to punch people because it's funny, then you have your option here. So Brave Knuckle comes with uh, the equivalency of, I think, general battle, which is 5% attack speed. Angry Fist, which is a much steeper requirement, almost 210 more ATP, and a much, much higher damage. So keep in mind, chat, we were talking about how uh, Inferno Bazooka was broken for being 400. The Fist can potentially go to 490. Angry Fist can go to 600. So we can get 
basically the highest ATP in the game outside of uber rares or like episode 4 specific rares so if you're looking for a casual drop in episode 4 that is hilariously good on forces angry fist on male forces this comes with a built-in 10% attack speed it also naturally gra gives you 10 defense so rather than going unarmed you can literally just put angry fist in your weapon selection and who knows this much atp i mean 560 atp and the requirement to use it basically means you double your attack power so this is a really crazy like very late very hard mode early ultimate item that you could get in hard mode that is i'm not gonna say is run defining specifically but let's call this uh a very useful gimmick item so there's one scenario where this is like by far the weapon of choice until you can farm ultimate reminder vault up has a glitch in episode one where damage is calculated based off your character's atp which includes his base atp the units armor shift to d-band and the atp of the weapon so if you end up with a machine angry fist like 30 40 50 60 70 percent angry fist machine is really stupid good you are going to kill that boss so fast with gazond you will actually think the game is broken the game doesn't anticipate you doing this and that's why i put it under niche you're not normally going to have a lot of atp on force it's hard to get but if you put in the work for it it is actually really good as a easy to pick up alternative to excalibur that you could just get while casually playing the game and again, you could just punch people. If you run out of ATP, like, this 560 ATP is literally how much you would probably have as the force. So if you're playing, you know, Fomar, and you decide to put on Power Mag, because you decide you're in an area that is not great for spell casting, like, let's say, Episode 2, and you want to do some damage, well, with the Power Mag, which, you know, 610 ATP might be, like, the tail end of level 70, maybe, like level low 80s depending on how leveled up your mag is uh could be very good but again very 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 niche this is something you kind of do as like coming back in with a second character you could do this the more realistic option for a first time character is the 400 atp where you don't necessarily need like a crazy max character and honestly like if we were to compare any weapon type that the force can use there's only one other weapon that even comes remotely close, and this still has a much lower requirement, and this allows for fast casting. So this will still edge out that other weapon before you get like some of the uber drops or better drops in uh, ultimate. So I'm going to list this as niche. There are some characters with good punching animations. I don't recall them offhand, but try it out. I, I know for a while off stream, I don't think I have any recorded games of when I did use Angry Fist. When I was leveling my Fomar to 90, I had Angry Fist on him to save TP because he could normal power power kill Boomas on ultimate, which is funny. It's really funny to kill them with Fist Chat. I feel like it sends a message. <laughs> so I'm going to put this under niche. It has one specific use versus... Uh, being what we'll call a pseudo Excalibur, which has 800 base ATP and is ridiculously good against full up. Um, this one is just, if you don't like menuing to undo your weapon and you just want to have multiple ways to menu to become unarmed, this is a pretty good alternative. So anyway, chat, we have a very short list of things that you could find in episode four. This is for people that are looking to do uh, level up runs with other people. Uh, if they were curious where to get these things, Photon Crystals are everywhere. Let's talk about one rare that's really, really good. So we mentioned before you could do the Talesius Mag and our Mag Creation. Hard Mode Boss Chamberton, which is very easy to do if you have Point of Disaster uh, for Episode 4 Unlocked with your team. Is a really easy way to start getting mags for all your characters. Again, recommendation is if you're playing a completely fresh character... It's better to just go to hard mode and go back to normal, or go to very hard mode than go back to hard mode episode 4. I promise you the XP is really easy and the drops are 
still probably better than anything you could get on every difficulty. So we're not going to go through all the individual runs here. Just be aware of these. You can still get a Rappi's Beak if you're looking for them. So I want to draw attention to one additional thing we'll be talking about uh, at the very end of this video, which is the Claire Deals components. So Secret Gear Attribute Wall forms something called From the Depths. Which is a completely crazy shield. You can see it's required level 150 to use. So this is not something you need to worry about before going to ultimate. Just be aware of why you would collect these in the lower difficulties. It is phenomenal resistances. You can see it has a 40 in lightning. has a 28 in dark resistance, 28 in light. Only the fire is a little disappointing. I would have liked to have seen this to be 25. But it is fantastically high defense. Literally double that of secret gear. And double that evasion of secret gear. So just fantastic defensive option. Um... Most people will use it more for the resistances than anything else. There are better shields for resistances, but this is probably the easier combo shield to do. I just wanted to draw attention to that very briefly. Um, there are Ajitos, which are Katanas, which you can use as a standalone weapon. I mean, like, 30, 350 ATP, which you've used in 400 base ATP is pretty good. But, like, just be aware it's still worse than Angry Fist. Like, just genuinely be aware. Like, it's still it's still worse. Brave Knuckle is about on par, but remember, Brave Knuckle still fast casts. Um, the only thing that might edge this one out over that choice is there's an armor we could talk about later called Samurai Armor from... Um, well, again, we'll talk about it later. But essentially, it adds 30% ATP. This is where there could be an argument made that this could be the pseudo Excalibur of choice. Or characters like the Faux New World, who have like really terrible ATP and might need to do it for boss damage. Just be aware of that. There's there's a couple options for pseudo Excalibur. I think that's all I wanted to mention there. Oh, Brave Hammer also combines into something. Sorry. So Brave Hammer by itself uh, is basically a damage focused rod with spirit. So like. Technically, it's technically it's not a bad item. It's just you probably won't really use it for that. You'll be forming something called Mercurius Rod, which actually has an incredibly useful special. So let me talk about why people do this. This this rod by itself seems like it's really good. Like wow, 80 MST. Sadly, due to the minimum requirement of MST, this is never worth getting for unlocking techniques, and the damage is very subpar for the star rank of what it's at. Um, the reason people use the Gafoe is not because this does damage, but because of a mechanic within the game. So when enemies charge you, if they happen to hit something that damages them, they stop charging. Now if you have a high level Gafoe, that can mess them up, because if they're not in the charging animation, when they get struck, they ignore damage and can continue charging and hurt you. This guarantees you have a low-level Gafoe at all times to stop you from being hurt. So, like, Zoo Dive Bombs, Dwarf on Charges, Del Beater Charging, etc. This is one of the weapons of choice. So, people will use this not for its stats, not for anything else, but just because it has a special of Gafoe. So, every time you hit special, you can combo chain Gafoe. Anyway, just talk about those briefly. Those are things that are not really going to carry you out of Ultimate. They're just nice things to collect. We'll put it under nice things to collect. So anyway, chat. Uh, we covered this before. There's Deep Hearts version 101. Or 1.01, I should say. You can technically farm them from Dark Gunners instead of the Bow Claws on Hard Mode. I recommend you just do Hard Mode. The run is easier, comparatively. The rare rate is slightly different, but Dark Gunners are also really annoying to kill in general. But I thought I'd list it here in case you're playing through episode 1 on Green ID. Uh, Disco of Brain Man is back. We're not going to open that up. We've seen that before. Uh, more IDs are starting to get it. You'll see White ID have probably the better choices for the most part between episode 1 and episode 2 of rare enemy drops. And in general, White ID is like the Slicer ID. So now we're coming up to our first best in slot that is new. This is a female only item. Quirrell's Parasol. 
so this has a fairly high requirement. Anything that starts going over 400 is pretty hard for a new player to get into. But this item is so good, I need to tell you about it. Like, you can farm it on very hard. By, uh... Actually, I didn't listen what we fight here. I believe they are Pyrogorons. Yes, they are. So this is where I gotta double check, Tim. So, a great... Great drop. So, why is this weapon so good? Well, one, it's a Partisan. Partisans are generally good. I think the females have the better Partisan animation in general. So that's number two. Number three, it is a charge special. So, it already has one of the best specials in the game you can get on a weapon. Uh, I guess next point would be, or point, I think we're up to point four, I wasn't paying attention. Um, ATP is pretty high, so pretty good weapon to use against Worm Boss or just crowd control in general. And then on top of that, on top of just being ridiculously good in terms of stats for what it is, it also gives 100% boosted range to Shifta, D-Ban, and healing. <clears throat> so if you're playing like a Hugh Newell or a Ramarl that might not have level 30 techniques and have the range that the rest of it does of the forces, this lets you basically heal the whole room. So honestly, it has just so many uses as both a great weapon, crowd control, buffs. If you could get one with hit percentage, you're going to be using this basically the whole game. The moment you get it as a female character. It, it, it is actually genuinely that good. Uh, next up we have a God Battle, which we saw we could gamble for. But if you don't gamble, the earliest you could get it, I believe, is on very hard fighting uh, Dwarf on Eclair, which is awful. That is an awful farm, but it's there if you really want to do it. And it's only really topped off by the second worst farm of the game, I would say, and that is Pazuzu. <laughs> like, Dwarf on Eclair doesn't show up. Pazuzu is slightly more common, but also does not show up. So pick your poison. You have two incredibly rare chances of Perfect finding these things. Up. Hello, Toriel. Hopefully you're doing well. And finally, if you're looking for uh, Dragon Scale, uh, now at this point, I'm going to list it at best in slot. But welcome, Raiders. Yeah, we're going through an item uh, guide for people looking to get, get into PSO, just to catch people up. We have not too much more to go, fortunately, since this is going to be a super, super long video. Apologies in advance to the people watching. So... Next up we have... So we covered best in slots for very hard mode. So let's talk a little bit about uh, God Armed and Heavenly Armed. So if you can't get access to Episode 4, your best bets are probably... Probably Sky ID, Hilda Blues, I would say. Otherwise, I would try one of the other IDs to get 15 accuracy. Or you could get the definitively better unit, which gives 25 attack accuracy usable by all classes by just casually playing through episode 4. Satellite lizards are one of the most common enemies in the game and are relatively easy to kill for forces. So this is just a fantastic farm option and completely, completely, completely unfair that uh, you could do that in episode 4. So well, welcome to the privilege. <laughs> just just welcome, Chad. Just, just blue blue IDs like yeah I'm just gonna get like 25 extra accuracy for like just killing like a really easy common enemy yeah that seems fair. Anyway we're gonna mention one last time Grass Assassin Arms and we will not mention it again I promise. Um, I have two things of God Battle did I forget to split my notes? I think I'm gonna move this out of best in slot. That just makes more sense. God Battle is good, but it's like, there's easier ways to get it. I think I'm just going to leave it here for now. One moment, chat, as I just double check one time to make sure I'm not forgetting anything here. Yeah, like, technically you could farm it on Morphos. I don't, I don't recommend it. <laughs> Alright, chat, like, you, you could, if you're really desperate, 
if you want that god battle, by all means. Uh, meanwhile, we're gonna see more episode 4 privilege. With the fantastic heavenly power, which adds 55 ATP to your character. So remember those 400 to use items, remember those 600 to use items. But with 4 slots, uh, what is that if we do the math on that real quick. 220 of that ATP could purely come from these units. So suddenly only getting about 180 ATP between materials and mag and levels is, doesn't seem that high of a number to achieve anymore. <laughs> we just get four of those. So if Chad is wondering why I put some of those niche items there, it's mostly due to the presence of things like Heavenly Power. Although, please note that this is a rare hunt and is terrible. But who knows, maybe it'll happen. Heavenly Power are much easier to farm on higher difficulties, but they're there. Heavenly Luck is also kind of a nice one. Love I put Rare Dwarf on because I forgot what it was called. <laughs> I could tell when I went back in the notes later where I missed things. So Heavenly Luck is just another simple 40 to luck. I want to talk about one thing that's actually important to know about. Let's talk about Holy Ray. So this is a rifle. So one, this is one of the only ways to get a sniper on Hunters, since normally they can only get that. Um, two, it has an arrest special, which is really, really, really solid. Three, the accuracy is insane. 70 accuracy is crazy. Uh, four, forces can use this. And then number five, I probably should have listed that first, was MST requirement. So this doesn't require you to have any attack power. You just need mind score. So this is kind of a direct upgrade to the Barista that you got earlier. But it might be on a hunt that's kind of annoying to do. Dwarf on Eclair is not going to be all that common. But do be aware that it is very easy to farm an ultimate comparatively. And just be aware that this item exists. Because this might help for ATP damage. So we have a classic hunt for the defensive units of a god HP from the rare Lillian Caves. We have how you normally get the cure units. I would recommend you probably do the 1k gambles, then do these particular hunts, but if those are not an option for you, just be aware that's how you get to them. Uh, attribute wall could be farmed in very hard, apparently. Yes, it can. But I don't think it's worth doing in very hard. I think it's worth just doing in hard mode. Honestly, the hunts are more annoying for the most part, unless you're fighting like Gaigui specifically or Gibbles on very hard. So then I think maybe the drop rate difference is worth it. It's like 10 times easy to farm, but there's also like 10 times less of the enemy. So however you want to view it there, those are your options there. Uh, we talked about Devil Battle before, which is 1% uh, attack speed. So if you're just playing casually in uh, blue and yellow ID, you could get it from Dubchick. However, with access to episode 4 and gambles, there's really no point to going for this. Uh, Devil Technique can also be used towards a Claire's Deal thing to get something called Heavenly Technique. Take a look at this briefly. We talked about the other thing where... God Technique added 3 to Technique level, Devil te Technique just adds 2. I'm looking for the item, here it is. So, this is one of the components needed in order to get Heavenly Technique, which adds 4 to all levels. However, I think this one is just purely niche and more of a show-off thing. Most of the time, it's very easy to get to rank 27 of a Technique. Uh, when you're playing on Ultimate or starting a new character that already has access to Ultimate level Techniques. So, you won't really see this commonly used, like, at all. But... Technically, if you've never gotten a level 27 technique before, it could be useful. But I feel like that time frame is pretty limited, so that's why I put it under niche. Um, there's also something called the Magic Rock Mula that you can pick up as you play the game. So this can form two different items. One is the Summit Moon, one is the Aura Field. So this is a combination item that you can potentially farm in mostly, I would say, Episode 1. So Summit Moon is a cane that grants a decent amount of MST, but unfortunately the requirement is kind of high for learning early techniques. Uh, its main benefit is that it provides 30% Foey, Zond, and Barda, aka the basic techs, and is probably the number one staff that's used for Fonu Roll, because one, it reduces the amount of uh, weapon rotation you need to do to maximize your simple techniques, and also three, she's probably the only person using Zond or Foey in normal scenarios by this point in the game. 
Barda, of course, is really good, but the 10% difference might not change your damage threshold compared to the other club that we reviewed in hard mode. So just as an alternative, if you can't get the other one, maybe consider getting Summit Moon. Sometimes being able to hold more items in your bag is more important. And uh, finally, we have something called Aura Field, which has a visual effect, so I thought I'd show that off briefly. Um, it has insanely high defense, and it has really solid dark and light resistance, so some people will get this. Unfortunately, the level requirement is really high, so don't expect this to be useful, basically, at all during your climb. Just be aware that you could get this for the future. Similarly, there's a component called the Spirit Garment. Let's take a look at this. And this can form a whole bunch of different items. Probably the most important thing that it can form is... If you combine it with something called a Star Amplifier, there is something called the Brightness Circle that you could create with it. This is the best... F oh, I can even see in the description, so... <laughs> I didn't read the description before, but apparently there. Um, it's the highest source of EDK that I'm aware of that female characters can have. Uh, males get something called the Dress Plate, which adds 70 EDK, which is, I think, the best EDK you can get in the game. So males have an easy way of ignoring insta-death. Females, this is the best they can do. But the defense on it is also pretty solid, so it's not bad. So I thought I'd mention some of those. They're more niche since this is not really going to help you climb. You're not going to use the base component at all. It's just literally there for something in Ultimate. So you have something to look forward to as a reward, I guess. Um, finally, under Niche, we have two things. We have the Flow and Frame and Flow and Shield. You won't really be using these for their stats. You can see forces can't use them. It's mostly to get the set effect of 50% attack power, 50% frame defense, 50% uh, shield evasion. And you need all three to get the bonus. So I'm just listing them there. We'll very briefly show their stats, but... These are not going to be necessarily game changers. Unless you're using Flow and Sword, then it's decent damage. And Shield here is okay. So you can see, like, this is like a much harder to get Shield. You only get it in very hard. The level requirement is higher. The resistances are generally lower. The defense is still roughly the same with Secret Gear. So if you have a Secret Gear attribute wall, there's no reason to go for the Shield unless you are either trying to form from the depths, which as a reminder was this Shield we saw earlier or you're going for the flow and sword bonus. So that's why I put it under niche. You have better options earlier on easier farms. Uh, finally, there's something called the Heaven Striker Coat, which we talked about briefly. Uh, it's a very common run for people to do when they're trying to level. If they're feeling that you're too weak for ultimate and you go back to episode four, very hard mode. Blue ID is such a crazy run. In fact, Blue ID is so crazy, we have a separate section in the item list. To explain why that is one of the best IDs pre-Ultimate. So, <laughs> don't worry, chat. We'll cover that. So I'm not going to go over the items again that we've already reviewed. We've talked. We've seen the, the Jaya uh, Partisan. We've talked about Last Survivor. Uh, final Impact you could get from... Rare Hilda Bear. Hilda Blue. There we go. Whenever I catch this, I'll try to change it. I'm sure I missed a couple throughout the list, because there are a lot of enemy runs. Um, but Final Impact, fairly easy to get. You might just coincidentally get it while going into very hard mode Forest. Uh, Guilty Light is now much easier to get, comparatively. Since uh, instead of farming Astarks on hard mode, you just have to fight the Mines boss. Which is, uh, you know, not too hard to do. It's so really up to you if you want to farm, uh, you know, something like Photon Launcher on hard mode, or just wait till very hard but then get less use out of it, because you're about to come into really good items in Ultimate. It's kind of a tough call there, but I just figured I'd talk about it. But we're going to just correct our notes to be as accurate as possible. So we already talked about the branch of Paku Paku. I'm not going to open that one up again. Heavenly Mind is nice, but it's only available from Dwarf on Eclair. Just like... It's iffy. This is something you won't farm for it specifically, but if you happen to be leveling in Episode 4 as a Force on Pink ID, which it should be pretty common, honestly, if you're starting Pink Force, 
Uh, then, you know, you might just get a nice big buff. So if you manage to not get the canes on uh, hard mode with pink ID, uh, they're basically everywhere in very hard mode with pink ID. And in fact, if you want basically access to all the amplifiers of the game, pink ID also has basically all the amplifiers. I don't know if they're missing any, but they have all the core recommended ones that are meta. We'll leave it at that. If you want to get an easier ang Angry Fist, you could just fight the boss in Episode 2, Barbara Ray. And finally, Chad. We're not going to go through everything Episode 4 has, because it would just be... Like, literally, literally every item we've gone through is in Episode 4. So instead of doing that, I'm going to spare you and shorten it so you can see condensed how unfair Episode 4 is and how unfair... Blue ID is on very hard, and why we run blue ID on our stream. So in very hard mode, in a single run of a single quest, there are two different enemies with photon crystal drop chances. I could get Cure Confuse, I could get Rappy's Beak, I could get Ignition Cloak, which I don't think we covered. I think I missed those two, so we'll back up slightly. There's two cloaks that you could get here. One is the... One is Ignition Cloak, the other should be Congeal Cloak. We'll back up slightly. So these are armors that a Force can use. Stat-wise, they're pretty unimpressive. They have a high level requirement, so it's not something you can use immediately in a very hard mode. But it gives 10% damage to all techniques, so they're considered basically best in slot for the character. So not only do you get like a best in slot armor, you get heavenly arms, which is phenomenal when leveling characters. You get heavenly luck, which if you're doing anything with ATP, you're going to be critting all the time. Caduceus is a component for uh, the Maricus Rod, I think that we looked at earlier. We have Jaya, which again, we saw was the, one of the best ones in the game. Heaven Striker Coat, which is one of the best mags in the game, Dragon Scale. So they have basically everything they ever want in one run. And a lot of IDs are like that, but Blue ID in particular, Episode 4, totally bonkers. So if you're trying to figure out what ID to, if you're making a new force to level other players, and you also want to get relevant items for your characters, uh, definitely pick Blue ID. So I think, chat, we've covered almost all the items. I'm going to skip a few of these. We didn't talk about Yamato. Technically, you could fight Dragon for it. But it's not really worth it over the Berserk of Musashi. It's technically stronger. Oh no, is, is the sight down? That's so sad. Oh, there we go. It's technically stronger than Musashi, so I guess if you really don't want to use the Berserk special, it's technically a direct upgrade to Musashi. The only other item I'm going to point out in this list, aside from what we're about to talk about here, Blind Divine. This one is actually insanely good. The requirement is bonkers, so you're probably not going to get this without getting those Heavenly Mines we saw earlier or maxing out a mag, but... It has a special where Jelen and Zalur are doubled in range. So, you basically hit the whole room. Then, it's one of the only items in the game that offers resistances. Did you know that, chat? Did you know you could get 15 to all resistances? What a great item for a support force to just not take damage. So hey, if you just want to become near immortal to uh, certain bosses, by all means, a quick glide divine laugh at game. 15% damage reduction is huge, plus it also gets 50 to defense. So really solid tanky rod. It has a gimmick where if you hold it for 10 minutes, you can use the item in your item pack to recover your TP, but it sets your HP to 1. I'm going to be honest with you, I've used it once, and that was mostly as a joke. I will let you know it's there. It's not usually used. Again, unless you go AFK, then you might as well just put it on, I guess. Maybe you'll recover stuff. It is a special to cure yourself, which I think... Actually, now I have a question. Hmm... I'm trying to think if that's a high enough level to remove paralysis. No, I don't think that matters. 
Yeah, because you, you can't attack with paralysis anyway. I was curious if you could attack with it to cure yourself of paralysis, but I'm like, no, no, you can't, by definition. Unfortunate. Uh, finally, there's one more component for From the Depths that you can acquire. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry, not from From the Depths. There's one more component shield you can acquire. Again, the stats on it are okay, but it has terrible resistances. But the Stink Shield, which you can pick up from Gerda Blues, can turn into D Roll A Shield. Resistances on it are not great. It looks neat. Got the nice little skull face there. More importantly, it offers raw defense. Like, this this defense is phenomenal. It's one of the highest in the game. So if you're looking to just survive hits, which can be a problem when you're not really geared in ultimate, this is a great, not super hard to get to. Yeah, Glad, yeah, Glad Divine gives you resistances. So if you just don't want to die, like, to stupid, like death attacks just go ahead and wear it the downside as i said before rod slows your spell casting down so most people don't use it but hey if you're trying to if you're just trying to resist the boss there's no reason not to i guess if you have it i mean it's 15 percent less damage it's 15 percent less damage anyway d roll a shield is pretty niche but i used it on my ramar before i got better items with him before he had enough raw atp to carry since I do think there's a difficulty jump going from very hard to ultimate where the clear speed is so much worse than ultimate that certain characters struggle initially so anyway chat we're we actually managed to get through all the items of the difficulties believe it or not we're gonna do one quick quick checklist as a reminder of where to get these things but we've listed out where all the cosmetic items are for people that are looking to copy the look and feel of the items so like db saber will turn another item to look like db saber as an example again affinia only i've listed out all the meta locations of all the important amplifiers of gafoe gazan rabarda rafoe i've listed out what enemies you have to go against to get uh photon crystals If you're curious who gets them, it should be all here. 